On behalf of the director, Susan Weber, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you today to this symposium. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, or, or good evening, depending on where you are. <clears throat> the Bard Graduate Center uh, on West 86th Street uh, on the island of Manhattan, or Manahata, sits on the uh, ancestral homelands of the Leni Lenape people, Lenape Hoking, a home for indigenous peoples for many generations. I happen today to be speaking to you from another island off the coast of Long Island, whose history uh, in complicated ways leads us to today. It was an island included in the original Plymouth Company land grant made by James I of England in 1620. In 1636, Charles I of England sold the island to an individual who in turn gave this particular island to an agent of his to act uh, as his attorney in colonizing Long Island. Uh, and this person then again uh, sold the island to another person who was one of the founders of the New Haven colony where Yale University was founded later. Uh, and this man in 1651 sold the island to a group of Barbados sugar merchants who in turn uh, settled on this island and established uh, a plantation. First in 1652, purchasing the island by agreement with Yugko uh, or Pogatikut, the Sashem of the Manhasset tribe. Uh, and then in setting up a plantation, he brought slaves from Africa and English indentured servants to work the land. Uh, so the history of this place where I'm speaking from now is a colonial history and then not long after a post-colonial history. And it reminds us through the marks on the landscape of what Hannah Arendt, one of the luminaries of Bard College, her library uh, is kept there, uh, said about the relationship between work and labor in the making of culture. We think of cultura as the human intervention in the landscape, but the work of the hand is a deep part of what culture constitutes. And that brings us to today's topic, the idea of design and its place in modern Asia is a fascinating lens through which to observe not just the work of the hand, but its relationship to making the wider world in which we live in. Uh, it's my great pleasure, therefore, to uh, launch today and tomorrow's symposium and handing over the platform to Sandy Young, who uh, was a visiting fellow here at the Bard Graduate Center in 2018-19, but whose permanent position is at Hong Kong Polytechnic School of Design, where she's been since 2008. She received her PhD from the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London after doing her undergraduate and master's work in Hawaii at the University of Hawaii. She runs uh, in Hong Kong the specialism in history of design, and her own specialty is in modern Chinese art. Uh, and culture. Uh, and with that, it's my pleasure to uh, invite her to the Zoom podium. Sandy? Thank you, Peter, for that very nice um, introduction. And I'm just going to briefly introduce the symposium. It was actually during my fellowship at Bard Graduate Center that I thought how interesting it would be to gather a group of researchers who are doing very interesting work in design and material culture and from different um, Asian culture together, examining the complexity and the correlation between material culture and design. And um, we have four themes for the symposium um, that some of us will touch on throughout our paper and the four themes are the nature and experience of materiality and the social effects of material culture, aesthetic as a cultural expression and the biography of a design. Our first speaker for today um, is Stacy Pearson, who's professor in the history of Chinese ceramic at the School of Oriental and African Studies in the University of London. She's uh, editor of the Transaction of the Oriental Ceramic Society in London and series editor for the Routledge series, Histories of Material Culture and Collecting. Her most recent book is entitled Private Collecting Exhibitions and um, the Shaping of Art History in London, the Burlington Fine Clubs, um, 1866 to 1950. 
She's currently preparing a monogram on the archaeology of porcelain, which will include a chapter on the tiles from Yunming Yuan in China. So I now pass the mic to Stacy. Thank you very much, Sandy. I'm going to start today by talking about um, ceramics, as you might expect from my specialism, and particularly East Asian ceramics. I'd like to start by looking at the work of the artist Li Xiaofeng, who in 2010 was commissioned by the fashion company Lacoste to create his own version of their iconic uh, polo shirt. And as you can see, he decided to make that out of broken porcelain. So he created new porcelain vessels and then broke them and then reconstituted them as a porcelain polo shirt. So not only has he transcended the original material of the polo shirt, which would be fabric, but he's reproduced it in ceramic but from ceramic fragments. So he's created a new hole. And in doing that, he was using the fragment or the shard as a medium. And this is what I'd like to explore briefly, the use of the shard as a medium in East Asia, because it forces us to rethink the, rethink the materiality of the shard and ceramics in general. Now, the use of the shard as a medium has a long history, which I will briefly explore, but it's associated with archaeology, collecting, and restoration. It also challenges notions of both completeness and value, and suggests that shard culture itself is a material culture phenomenon. So there are three material contexts in which the shard develops into a medium and through which it is developed as a medium. And these are archeology, span architecture, and contemporary art and craft. So starting with archeology, span this is perhaps the way in which most people experience ceramic shards. Of course, ceramics are often the most ubiquitous material found in archaeological sites. They're also important for the dating of sites, for the understanding of um, the context of the sites um, and their history and use. And in particular in China, ceramic archaeology as a subspecialty has really developed over the last 50 odd years to the extent that archaeological ceramics, particularly shards, have been transformed into museum exhibits. As you can see in this example here, which actually was an exhibition at the Palace Museum in Beijing in 2016. And by taking these archaeological fragments, which are technically kiln trash, that is kiln wasters, they're not perfect pieces that have been broken, but they are the wastage from production. By taking these and placing them in the museum, the museum effect comes into play. And so they become objects for viewing and their materiality then is experienced differently, almost as if they are works of art. And this is kind of what connects the shard to collecting, which is also a phenomenon um, that arose out of ceramic archeology span in China, for the last 30 odd years or more, it has been possible to go to dedicated so-called shard markets to buy what is unfortunately very often archeological material, that is it's been removed from the original sites. Um, but the market is such now that a lot of these are actually fake archeological material. But it's through collecting also that we see the shard becoming available as a medium for other uses. And in particular, that's how it became available for use in the decoration of architecture. And it's not in East Asia that you see the, this happening at its earliest. It's actually in Europe. And one of the earliest surviving examples of the use of shards in architecture is on the surface of a shell grotto, which is at the Palazzo Frontera in Lisbon that was built in 1640. And you can see here that 
the traditional Rococo shell Greto aesthetic has been enhanced and developed here by the addition of East Asian ceramic shards. And these are embedded into the architecture. So they completely resurface it, they change its visual appearance, but also they change it texturally. And that gives you a completely different experience of the building itself. However, this has also been applied more recently in China in um, what is now perhaps a notorious example known as the porcelain house in Tianjin, which was open to the public in 2007 and is owned by um, a businessman and ceramic collector, um, Zhang Yanzhi, who resurfaced his house, which is in a traditional kind of European style, completely with shards and whole pieces. A number of the shards are actually archaeological ceramics. Many are modern, but meant to look old. And of course, many whole pieces that he owned and in some cases acquired specially for this purpose. So he too has completely redecorated and reform the aesthetic of this building. And in doing so, he has also openly declared himself as a ceramic collector. And of course that's reinforced by the name of the house. So the use of the shard to transform the surface is similar to the way that artists and craftspeople are using the shard to create new objects from ceramic material. And that's the last context that I'd like to look at. So if we go back to Li Xiaofeng, who I started with, I wanted to show you an example where he's actually using archaeological material to create um, imitation garments out of porcelain shards. In this particular example created in 2010, he has constructed it from Song period shards. So let's say 12th century Thelidon stoneware shards from archeological sites that he himself had collected. He sees himself as a ceramic collector as well as a sculptor. Now the fact that he's made it out of archeological material means that this work can never be exported from China. But it's not just in China that makers are using shards to create um, new objects. This is also happening um, in Korea. And one Korean artist whose work is represented in the British Museum, including this piece from 2018, is Yi Suk Kyung, who uses Korean Saladin in a similar way um, to Li Xiaofeng. In her case, I'm not entirely sure if the Celadins are actually old. They look new to me, but they're very much in the Cordio Celadin style. She's, however, using this to create vessels, which is a parallel form that the original pieces would have been in. Apart from some of them, if you look at the top on the right, you can see a fragment of a head of a figure. So her vessels are not being reconstructed entirely from vessel form, but also from other ceramic form. And you can see that she joined the fragments together using an epoxy that's then covered with gold leaf in a very clear reference to a important and very famous restoration technique that originated in Japan known as Kintsuchi. And you're probably more familiar with it as a form of restoration. And traditionally, it consisted of gold lacquer that was used to join fragments. So in Kintsuji, you are making fragments whole again. And I think that suggests to us that we should consider restoration as a craft. And it's through this way of approaching fragments using Kintsuji and considering it as craft that the final artist whose work I want to look at has used it to create new items that are much more domestic in nature and actually functional as new items, such as these chopstick holders that are made by Tomomi Kamoshita, who uses fragments of porcelain and glass, as you can see here, joined in a kintsuji technique, sometimes with lacquer, sometimes with epoxy. Now it isn't just 
humans, however, who are able to do this. I'd like to finish with a pair of objects that are in the Victoria and Albert Museum that have been made naturally. These are shards of porcelain that were fused together, probably in a fire that caused the wreck of a ship that's known as the Kamau Mau shipwreck that wrecked off the coast of Vietnam in the 18th century. And they are created by the fusion during the fire and then coral growing up through them. And the fact that the Victorian Albert Museum calls them sculpture demonstrate that they can be treated as works of art. So, in conclusion, I think we can say that the shard has a materiality that transcends its own composition and fragmentary state. It's not just a representation of incompleteness, but also an independent object formed from the destruction of another. And it can be used as a medium for the creation of new objects, a form of rematerialization. So I would say that means they are trash and treasure. Thank you. Thank you, Stacy. So now we have uh, five minutes for questions. Um, if anyone has any questions or comments for our first speaker today, and it should come in in the box, and I'm looking at the box. Well, we don't have any question from the box. Um, any question from fellow speakers? questions? Oh, hold on. Um, okay, we have one question. Can you talk about the artist's work with Cringe Lu Shang's J suit of yeah. the Han Dynasty? Yes, um, um, Li Xiaofeng is clearly referencing the Han Jade suit. Um, particularly in his work with Celadon shard, because you'll notice in the example I chose, he squared them off too, so that they looked like um, jade plaques. So of course that brings another material into the conversation. Okay. Now, next question is, does the porcelain house in Tianjin have ceramics on the interior as well? The porcelain house does have ceramics on the interior. Um, some of the walls are um, actually ceramic, so embedded with ceramics, um, and others um, have ceramic, more sort of traditional displays, like museum type displays. Um, but the house, I saw it um, about 10 years ago, so I understand that it has been altered recently, and I haven't been able to see the new iteration of it. Then um, we have a question about the theoretical works or concept that deals with rematerialization. Can you say a few words about that? Um, yes. Um, you know, in a longer version of this paper, I was going to address the idea of rematerialization, but it's a theory that intersects with ideas of um, the transformation of materials as well as the imitation of materials through transformative visual practices, in particular, um, one that is often associated with archaeology and ancient um, Greek and Roman material, and I'm speaking of skeuomorphism. So rematerialization Organization. Um, even though um, it hasn't, to my knowledge, been applied that much to, in particular, Chinese ceramics, um, it is something that intersects with and addresses themes that are important for um, ceramic when they're used as a, as a medium. So that's why I wanted to raise it as a possible theoretical frame for this particular discussion. Um, oh, we have a question. Um, uh, she likes to ask about the char as souvenir, and she's particularly thinking where a piece of something is worth more than the whole. Yeah, I mean, that that's for sure. That's why I briefly mentioned the fact that one of the reasons why um, the shard market is, is so popular is because people do, in many ways, think of these shards as archaeological souvenirs. Um, on the one hand, they are cheaper in the market than the actual whole piece would be. 
but by um, seeing them as a representation of a whole piece and in that kind of souvenir mode, thinking of Susan Stewart, um, they do then retain a kind of conceptual value that is much greater um, than the whole. So for sure, um, the, the idea of the souvenir can also be built into this discussion. And then we have a question about what are the defining features that make certain shards more valuable than others? Um, is it the day? Is it the kilt? Is it their design or something else? Um, it depends on um, what value you're asking about. I mean, if you mean for collectors, um, it depends on what it is a shard of. So um, for example, um, in, in the market, in the art market for whole Chinese ceramics, um, obviously Qing porcelains, you know, particularly Qianlong Markham period are achieving incredible prices at the moment. But in general, Song ceramics, let's say 12th century ceramics are not quite as highly valued. However, as shards, Song ceramic shards are actually literally more valuable than shards of Qing porcelain. Um, and to be honest, I haven't really been able to develop a true understanding of why that is. I'm just noticing it as a phenomenon. So it's an interesting question and it's something I hope to, um, to really tease out in, in the longer version of this talk. Okay. Well, I think that's all the question for the five minutes. So, so thank you very much, Stacey. And then if you have any more questions for those who are listening, um, perhaps you can ask us at the end um, when we have a, a summarizing discussion. Okay, thank you. Now, our next presenter is Niga Rajguru, uh, who is a joint academic program leader of the History of Art and Design program at the University of Brighton. Her research is in South Asian design history, material, and visual culture. She's currently co-editing a book titled Design and Modernity in Asia, National and Transnational Exchange. Um, the year would be 1945 to 1990s with our final speaker today, um, Dr. Yunami. So I will now pass the mic to you guys. Thank you, Sandy, for that introduction. I'm going to share my screen. Hello everyone. Um, so this paper I'm presenting today is a small part of a book project uh, beyond design and modernity in Asia, one that is in draft form in ideas in different documents in different places. So this is part of a bigger book project that focuses on design and development in India in the post-colonial years up to the 1990s, so the beginnings of globalization. And housing as one of the key areas for international development is one of the core areas of my research. In this brief paper, I aim to outline a critical methodology towards analyzing the working class interior that became a subject of interest for many architects, for development agencies, for, na for the national government um, and state level organizations. And I focus on these two decades um, Set nine, between the 1970 and the 1990, in particular because you see a real turning point um, in attitudes towards the urban poor. So from an immediate post-colonial Indian context beyond 1947, you see uh, the early years of development focusing on industrial development, focusing on using modernism as an appropriate design language um, to modernize the nation. Uh, towards the 1970s and the 1990s, there is a real interest in the heritage of India and projects such as the ones I'm going to focus on showcase how Indian architects who were seen as uh, proponents of Indian design, who understand how the Indians live, for example, are commissioned to produce um, housing projects, particularly housing projects for, for the urban poor. So there are various reasons why I focus on these two decades. Um, and the two architects I want to focus on very briefly, I will look at two examples of their work, um, Bal Krishna Doshi and Charles Korea, which many of you will have heard of. They're prominent, they're part of the Indian modernist canon. Um, but I'm through my research, I'm trying to look at their work from the perspective of developmentalism, 
and um, and some of those ideas have shaped um, this paper. In particular, the space I want to focus on in the interior is actually the immediate outdoor space, which which exceeds, which expands the interior space um, here. So state interest and concern to provide homes for the rural working classes had been at the forefront of the public debate in India, and in particular in the city of Bombay from the turn of the 19th century and into the early 20th. Owing to huge loss of life, the plague epidemic of 1896. The core concern during these decades was to keep workers in the city. They, they, had, they were leaving because of poor housing conditions and, and illnesses. Um, and um, the plague epidemic saw a real um, decline in the labor force in Bombay. So the colonial government, um, for the colonial government, the main project was to create housing for these workers that were sanitary and safe. So the debates during this period focused on how to construct homes for the poor while balancing finance and what the best rent structure could be. So rent becomes a major subject of discourse and debate. If built well, the rents needed to be raised, which meant many people began living in small spaces to distribute the rent amongst themselves, or if built with cheap materials and constructed fast with small rooms, the problems of safe conditions did not go away. And concerns with urban poverty and how best to manage good design with balancing of books continued in the post-colonial years with major debates on what a home for the low income worker might look like. Efforts to construct successfully financially viable social homes consistently failed and the projects of the 70s and the 80s are celebrated as successes now from the current moment looking back. Um, as they were seen as unlike the Chawls, we see a, a photograph of the a Chawl, which was built in the 1920s in, in Mumbai, um, now called Mumbai, then called Bombay. And these have been perceived by the two architects that I refer to here. It, Charles Curry writes extensively about the Chawls as undignified spaces. So we start to understand a question, then what, what sorts of solutions is he bringing to improved housing? For, for these people. Um, so I'm going to look at Bushi's work firstly. Um, here is one of the projects constructed in the early 80s by Balkrishna Doshi called Aranya Housing. And this project is based on the minimal housing principles and it included a built toilet, um, it included running water facilities and electricity. The core, according to Doshi, the core factors that creates a minimal home. The interiors included rooms with four walls and the outdoor space became a crucial site for activity and sociability. The interior space was discussed as a flexible space. And here is a quote from Doshi. He says, formed as compartments, the rooms get used for different things, depending on the attitude of the users and the occasion. Therefore, the character of the space is only established through the functions that take place. Um, so similarly, outdoor spaces was, were structured to enable flexible use. And so by organizing space um, in interior as well as exterior space, some form of order had to be imposed. And the use of terracotta exterior paint, the elements of light and shade were aestheticized. And in his writings, these become very obvious. So he's aestheticizing this form of life through these designs and through the images that his uh, studio is producing at the time, which he describes as uh, the visualization of the site um, had greater aesthetics and, um, and it provided visual conformity to the elements. Um, so terracotta I, is a separate paper here, but terracotta becomes a color, um, a pigment, and as a, a symbol of a working class home and uh, a suitable color um, that matched the earth and matched the elements. In his book um, by, um, called um, Of Greater Dignity and Riches, Han Karim discusses traits of austerity in architecture as austere modernism, celebrated in post-colonial India within the framework of development. 
So here I want to trace this further and ask what the role of the street within austere design is and how the street features as a crucial space in relation to the interior. <clears throat> And so, so images such as these are abundant in, in, the, in the archives of the two architects. So I want to uh, get, get, trace very briefly what these images mean and what living on the street meant for them through looking at Dipesh Chakravarti's work very briefly. In his essay of Garbage, Modernity and the Citizen's Gaze, Dipesh Chakrabarti discusses the relationship between modernity and the street, the garbage, the bazaar, the lives of the people outside their homes. He discussed the European view of the Indian subject on the street as one that seeks to correct and improve yet the fixed nature of the subject as inherently backward highlighted the dilemma of how to improve the environments. Chakrabarti asks, how must a, nation, a modern Indian citizen respond to life, piling on the streets towards garbage and dirt? And within this context, I want to trace how the two architects organized the lives of the people for whom they were asked to build homes. Architects such as Doshi in Korea produced numerous images such as these, recording the ways in which people in the city lived by the roadsides or, the, or um, how families in rural India lived. <coughs> These images mark a real ethnographic interest. <coughs> I'm sorry. These images mark a real ethnographic interest in the material culture of daily lives, in the habits of the people, and, and that are marked in their, in their writing as tradition, and the use of spaces as heritage and as tradition as tradition and the and the spaces as heritage. So the modernist architect is finding inspiration and is seeking opportunities to solve problems. I argue that these images form part of the visual lexicon of India and the poor. The exterior views of the people's homes, <coughs> the gaze of the modernist architect is made explicit in these images and that they continue to function within modernist backdrops such as these. <coughs> it is clean and it is ordered. And this is a project produced by Charles Korea um, in Mumbai, in Belapur. And I, and I write about this project in, in other, uh, other papers. The core aspect of minimal living here for Korea was the ability for people who lived in these homes to expand their homes, to use the outdoor space and to implement growth. So flexibility alongside standardization becomes one of the core, core uh, principles of design for both Doshi and Korea. <clears throat> and as Doshi highlights, the sari that the Indian woman wears is only a six yard long piece of cloth, but when worn looks very different on each woman, despite its standardized production. This suggests that when the elements provide inherent flexibility, a personalized combination and individual identity can emerge. <coughs> I'm really not sure what's happened to my throat just in the middle of giving a paper. I do apologize. So in this case, minimum you dwelling. You have one minute left. Okay, I'm, I'm, this is my last few sentences I'm finishing. Okay. Minimum dwelling here would offer flexibility and the street would help accommodate what were described as the needs of the people. The street with its intermediaries of the veranda and the courtyard would become a crucial part of the interior. It was the semi-public, <coughs> semi-private space <coughs> that was seen as the, the space of freedom and at the same time it marked equity. So the person who owned the space ultimately would pay off money for the space could grow their space. So the outdoor space became the site for equitable living. It, it would become property, ultimately real estate. And the idea was from communal living, living on the spaces in a, um, and sharing the streets that they would provide homes that would become individualism. 
So this form of developmentalism um, became a trajectory towards individual lives, towards what would become a neoliberal housing market in India. And we see those principles embedded within the, the designs, aspects of color and the use of um, the spaces as how people have lived and live uh, cloaked with heritage um, shows us developmentalism with nationalist sentiments. So after this point, social housing and a concern for the poor starts to wane, marking these projects as central to a bygone past. The street and the everyday space becomes even more fetishized and enters middle class homes as symbols of heritage and symbols of the poor. Thank you. Thank you, Amiga. Okay, so I think we need to give the audience perhaps a minute to ask questions, which was what happened just now. Okay, um, the questions are coming in. Um, can I ask Miga about these designs for communal and individual living in relation to ideas about Indian society um, as a collective society? Absolutely, that was, those were the ideas. This was about, but, but we see this particularly central to homes that were created for what they called the masses in the period. So collectivism is very much a part of an ideology for, for these projects. Okay. Um, the next question is, how do these new modernist dwellings align with traditional dwellings layout? Are they imposing new ways of living? Um, traditional um, dwellings is what they are turning to. What I'm arguing is that they are trying to order something that is already in place. They're trying to um, standardize. They're trying to create spaces that could become, that would mirror what they described as traditional life, but only elements of those lives. So, so um, what is not addressed really is our ways in which homes could be created um, that were, so my, my, my point here is not to provide design solutions, but my point here is to critique a middle-class architect's view of the poor and how they should live. So all the images show that they are on the streets. We see exterior spaces as predominant in these images. So as they would see the traditions, um, so-called traditions of the urban poor, and the rural traditional home um, is directed towards modernist architecture at, at the time. So I'm not saying they're directly transferred, but they become inspiration. They almost become uh, simulacra of tradition. Um, I, I could best describe them as such. Okay, the next question, um, the audience starts with how um, she appreciates the outdoor It's something that was newly embraced and that marks such a departure from colonial and state intervention. But um, the audience is curious about the limitation or constraint put on open space and the street. Even in these projects, how did the designs or the management of space curtail activities in the open? In, in, the, in particular, what we see, I'm going to read the question actually, that is a really good question. I, I think ways in which the constraints of the outdoor space become very obvious, and that is the latter part of my research. This, is, this focuses on the, the 70s and the, between the 70s and the 90s, but if you go to these spaces today, particularly the space in, in Bombay, um, these, the outdoor spaces have almost become a space of conflict of who uses it, how they use it, why they use it. So, um, so of, of course, there, there are limitations um, to what that outdoor space can, can do. But certainly the outdoor spa space is uh, symbolic uh, for the designers of, of these. And they are the same as interior spaces. In fact, they are more important for them. Um, then we have an audience who really appreciated your wonderful um, presentation, but she has a question about what happens to the space who is in charge of the maintenance. For example, the artist village is very differently appropriated as intended by Charles Correa. Um, 
in interviews with people that live there, um, there are there's a community, so there are shared courtyards um, where the people who live in that courtyard are responsible for the maintenance of that courtyard. Um, but that is up to the people. So the idea was not to impose a structure of maintenance, um, but I was no, um, while there was a standardized design that was produced for particular forms of living, the people that lived there had to organize themselves. Um, so this is unlike cooperative housing where the people design their own spaces, they think about how to produce these spaces for themselves. The architect has made this for them. So there's an inherent conflict in how that might work. So some courtyard spaces are very well maintained, others not so much. So you, you see a real uh, discrepancy um, in how they are maintained or managed. And for sure there is conflict within that. And one final question. This audience wants to know, how did the space reflect the caste question, if at all? Um, there are, there, there's a, there, there were really long, um, there are long documents that outline um, borrowing and the ways in which um, loans can be taken um, to purchase these. And then you pay small amounts uh, of rent and ultimately, so they're high purchase principles. Um, and so, so the cost, so investment, some of the investment in Artist Village came from World Bank money. So part of the money came uh, for infrastructure in New Bombay and part, and the other funding came from another organization called SIDCO. Um, and these, so different for Aranya, Aranya was very much a state funded, but also partly funded by international development agencies. Um, I write in a separate paper about all the different investments in social housing in the period. But here the cost is um, ultimately on the, um, on the person who owns the property ultimately. So they're paying small amounts of money. So that was the idea of the equitable living idea is of producing growth. So ultimately you own your property from um, living in this communal space. So I was, I, I hope I concluded uh, clearly in, in that fashion because this is ultimately about individualism and about um, what happens later on with real estate becomes very much central to um, the discussion of, of social housing. Well, that was the final question. Thank you very much, Mika. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now we move on to our next speaker, um, Hugh Yinker, who's a senior lecturer in the Department of Product Design and Not Nottingham Trent University in the United Kingdom. Um, her work explores consumer cultures of the Japanese bubble economy through the 1980s lifestyle magazine. Um, her chapter entitled Sweet Treats and Foreign Food, Hanaka Magazine and the Internationalized Women of the Japanese Bubble Economy will be coming out in the forthcoming publication entitled Modern Living in Asia. So I now pass the mic to Hugay. Thank you very much for inviting me to this talk. And before I start, I would like to say that I have actually a lot of slides of lots of images. So I won't be able to have any time to talk about them in depth, but I'm happy to, if you wish me to later on after the Q&A or you know, um, further on tomorrow. Um, and likewise, especially these slides have got quite a bit of text in them and they're just there to add a little bit of context and depth, but not necessary to read all of it. So please don't worry about that if I flick through slides very quickly. So through the lens of Hanukkah magazine, um, this paper, Health Booms and Bubbly Bodies, explores how women were a key actor in Japan's bubble economy as receiver of consumer strategies and instigation of rebellion and change. So in the 1980s, Japan's account surplus propelled its economy to second in the world, rivaling the United States. Responding to international pressure, Japan, Japan signed the 1985 Plaza Accord, agreeing to an artificial yen appreciation and economic opening to international markets, leading to massive booms in assets, consumption, and leisure. This feverish bubbly culture characterized the bubble economy, slowing only when interest rates rose at the end of 1989. So through the, oh, let's see if that will change. There we go. Through the passing of the EEOL, the Equal Employment Opportunities Law in 86, and government encouragement of a work-life balance through lifestyle and leisure, 
young women, known as office ladies, were viewed as both new workforce and prominent consumer trend. Working mostly in office administration with few long-term career opportunities and disposable income, they were seen as perfect recipients of the message to push Japanese society to a more consumer-based economy. Against this background, in 1988, at the height of the bubble, Hanaku magazine was founded, and it's still running today. Um, it broke new ground for Japanese women's magazines by fo focusing on leisure rather than fashion, and featuring everything from travel to restaurants, shopping to spas, Hanukkah represented a new way of living promised by the possibilities of the bubble. While focusing on lifestyle, beauty was a natural focus of Hanukkah's magazine, and here, uh, sorry, apologies, Hanukkah's demographic, and here's an example of the etiquette classes run at Panasonic for their office ladies. Broadly translating to cler clerical roles, OL duties, office ladies, um, their duties extended to services such as making tea, greeting clients, and brightening up the office with their presence. High standards of appearance were expected as essential to their office role and their long-term marital prospects. However, Japanese women represented in Hanako differ from this corporate and marital view of Japanese womanhood. Here, the Japanese woman appears intermittently with Western and Europe Eurasian models taking the passive role of being gazed at. Instead, the Japanese woman is the gaze looking out, filling the magazine with things, activities, and locations. When Japanese women appear, they're often portrayed active, doing something, or in groups. Rather than the demure tea-serving office flower, Hanukkah women are bold, bright, and colorful, often depicted outside having fun, stylish, modern, and go-getting. Encapsulating the energetic and zany zeitgeist of the bubble, they even put on outlandish costumes inconsistent with the modest, shy, and retiring beauty of Japanese tradition. While endearing and funny as this comic OL evolution uh, shows, this expressive and loud female identity is at odds with the passivity of traditional Japanese feminine modesty. In the dynamic arena of the bubble, cheerfulness held more currency in international corporate business, and so the bright and bubbly nature of OLs was emphasized and encouraged to further the needs of the Japanese economy. As new depictions of femininity were explored, a surprisingly prevalent and persistent one was through food. Despite women's traditional role being linked to food through the good wife, wise mother narrative, young single women were not main recipients of this message. Nevertheless, food is used in the dynamics of romance, assessing viability of partners and as expression of femininity. So another approach was the link between food, health and beauty, notably in the proliferation of foods for dieting, nutrition, health and energy drinks. These were indicative of another consumer boom as the frenetic pace of the bubble economy took hold. While normally associated with the hectic lives of salary men, adverts for these foods are bound in Hanako aimed at women. So here, women are portrayed often as active participants in control of their health and well-being, linked to sport of measure. Unlike other adverts for energy drinks uh, promoting masculine workplace stamina, these adverts promise to enable feminine enjoyment of an active lifestyle and leisure. Adverts for health foods sidestep any mention of romantic or family life, using the language of career advancement for ironically a non-existing career or a sophisticated modern lifestyle of the independent woman. In relation to what Miller terms the progenitor of future salary men, this can be read as a rebellion using the visual language of feminism despite their reality. So even as food was used in the service of lifestyle and the body beautiful, another significant consumer boom was in sport and fitness. Against the context of political consensus to reform Japanese society, Sport became another consumer activity to be developed in accordance with other international trends. However, although the bubble sporting boom has usually been identified as the golfing craze that swept Japan in the 1980s and 90s, privately sport was actually mainly aimed at women. While men's golf grabbed headlines, it was another sport such as skiing, tennis and aerobics that women were the new frontier and main consumer market in the boom in sports clubs and facilities. The privileges and elitism of sport and emphasis on the body thus come to be positioned for young Japanese women. To utilize their disposable time, income, and desire for leisure, sport became unlinked from masculinity, adopting a feminine strategy linking together beauty, travel, fitness, and enjoyment. Building on 1970s trends in Japanese tourism for individual individuality and spiritual richness. So it's this turn away from the hegemonic order, reclaiming space and becoming visible in public we see in young women accessing sport, especially visible in the physicality of participation. Linked to beauty and health, the body becomes emphasized and repackaged through accessories, fashion, and advertising. 
epitomized through the aerobic boom, women's bodies were sold to themselves through the new medium of sport. While fashion and beauty has been a long-standing feature of control and consumer commodification, it is this new medium of sporting athleticism that proved significant for this period. Along, for alongside restrictions in work roles and duties, young women also faced immediate controls over their appearance and presentation of manner at work, with the most presentable handpicked to serve in the most lucrative departments, if we remember that etiquette class that was a whole year long course in Panasonic. Young women's skills and bodies were thus tightly controlled and exploited for commercial gain. Sport thus provides a relief from the official demand for social control in young women's bodies, engendering a liberation, claiming back and rebellion from everyday expectations of modesty and propriety. While honing the body through sport and cladding it in skimpy sportswear may seem an exploitative commodification and sexualization of women's bodies, Positioned against the context of traditional Japanese demands of feminine modesty, shyness, and purity, women's deliberate engagement with sport as pleasure can be seen as an act of agency, redefining themselves as liberated bodies in the international sphere of modern sport. Where the emphasis on the physicality of women's bodies leads to is the exploration of nighttime leisure. Hanako often depicts women drinking and going out, demonstrating the determination of OLs for enjoyment. Here, OLs are no longer shy and retiring Japanese ladies, nor professionally elegant office ladies, but loud, vivacious, colorful, and sexy. As before, this type of Japanese woman is at odds with traditional views of femininity. This tension is re recognized in a series of adverts for, for Tora Bayou, a job um, hunting agency, where the notion of the professional OL, um, Japanese OL, is directly challenged through dress and appearance concepts of beauty and accompanying copy. It is this act of agency and liberation of the body that is both significant and contentious when applied to Japanese women. From the outside, it may be easy to critique as exploitative under Western influences of commercialization, over-sexualization and objectification of the body. However, positioned against the confinements of company uniforms and social restrictions on freedoms through cultural expectations of modesty, Trends such as the body conscious dress, drinking alcohol, going out, and participating in sports and exercise were part of a greater move towards liberating the female body and rebellion of Japanese women. Furthermore, through the act of being outside and participating in the consumer leisure boom, whether in sports clubs, resorts, bars, discos, or restaurants, young women's visibility in public spaces and financial independence enabled them to transgress specific Japanese social and cultural boundaries, colonizing new spaces for themselves. However, Although Japanese young women may be posited as liberating pioneers and beneficiaries of various consumer booms in the bubble, these conditions were predicated on their lack of participation and agency in the wider economy. Shut out from managerial track work, their disposable income and time were the result of being excluded from meaningful economic participation. Instead, what they were left with was a short-term agency to enjoy while they were single and working, exploited to fuel the sport and leisure industries that in turn fueled the consumer economic bubble. Thus, like the sexualization of women's bodies, where Japanese women were claiming liberation from Japanese conformity, whilst also buying into Western norms of female objectification, so trends in women's beauty, fashion, and leisure were claimed and enjoyed by Japanese women, whilst used to fund national and predominantly male economic prosperity. Nevertheless, this period marks a real sea change in the way young Japanese women presented and perceived themselves. Opportunities to participate in open public space and be visible in self-determined action, dress, and activities enabled young women to self-determine and negotiate additional socially acceptable ground that was both international and Japanese. In this, Japanese women were at the forefront of a new kind of East Asian identity, articulating a femininity that was both modern and culturally grounded. Creating a language of liberation, they appropriated selected international elements for local purposes, retranslating Western concepts to create a negotiated East Asian femininity suitable for a postmodern age. While not perfect, it is these legacies of modernity played out on the female body that continued after the bubble burst to create conditions for subversions and subcultural style that made up the vibrancy of Japanese modern culture in the 1990s onwards. Thank you very much for listening, everyone. Thank you, Fu Ying. So again, I will give it maybe a minute for um, our audience to send questions. It may take them just a little time.
Okay, while we wait for that, um, I just want to make a very quick comment, you know, um, all the images you show and you talk mm -hmm. about, um, you know, women doing sports and drinking as part of their liberation, it's quite similar to what women experience in early 20th century China. You also see a lot of that in, in the printed um, magazine, in, in all the printed material. So do you think that's sort of I don't know, a commonality about liberation that you, you almost have to show off the body to be liberated. Oh, absolutely. I think, I mean, it's, uh, I think this comes along in ways or loops, perhaps should we say, because in the 1920s in Japan, you also had the modern gyaru, the modern girl, um, where she had shorts, you know, 1920s hair, she went out drinking, um, you know, went out looking at for work. So I think there's definitely commonalities to do with modernity. I think the difference, and, and I do think this comes in waves, and, and it's similar to say 1960s in Britain, the miniskirts and so on, you know, with women, uh, and coincides with the pill and things like that. I think the difference in Japan is that um, it's firstly linked as well to independent income, even though women were, you know, meant to be um, marrying, or, you know, and then stopping work and all of that. But also, um, it's linked. Also, but it's it's different because it's it's there's a postmodernity to take into it, you know account, and the kind of mixing and matching of um, increased globalized culture, and participating in that. So I and and having to kind of, you know, reconfigure all of those sort of elements um, in a way which is um, much more linked to sort of postmodern ways of assimilating culture and the spreading information and enjoyment and so on. So there, it, it is definitely linked to a history of women's um, expression of liberation or attempts to gain public ground, but, um, but there's also slight differences as well. Okay. Oh, we have a question. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, the question is about the magazine. Is Hanukkah the only magazine with this type of portrayal, or is there a whole new genre that appears at this time in Japan? Like, are there so, magazines? Uh, yes, there are other Japanese magazines around at the time, but I think uh, Hanukkah is the one that focuses on leisure. The other um, Japanese women's magazines tend to be about fashion. Uh, and they have an older history. So their remit is based on those periods of time that they are first published and founded. So an, an, non, no, et cetera. And, and then Japanese magazines do have a long history, especially for women. And they either, they initially fall into the educational ca um, camp where it's about educating women to either become good housewives, <laughs> so lots of, you know, housekeeping tips, et cetera. Or it's, uh, the very first initial ones were also about um, a different kind of liberation. It's more sort of for the upper class woman reading literary things, literary magazines, put it that way. So we get different types of magazines. And then in the 1970s, you get like both the housekeeping ones, but also the fashion ones really coming up. But in the 80s, it's actually about leisure. So we see leisure becoming much more important for women. And pri primarily, I think it's because they start going to work more as young women and they have this disposable income and that it's more acceptable to see them in public enjoying themselves without male chaperones or anything else like that. So it, it's part of this development. So Hanako, I believe, is one of those first to do that. And of course, there are other magazines that come after, but I haven't studied them. Um, another question asked, was international travel a part of this too? Because there was a point where OL seems to be the targeted tourist market. Yes, so um, within my research, tra international travel is a huge part and it's such a massive part that actually there's no space usually to talk about it in conferences. I did so in Brighton many, many years ago, with, well, many, many, sorry, a few years ago, oh, my brain, um, which was, you know, fantastic to talk about, but I realized it's just it's too big a topic and it's something that I will be concentrating on getting published, um, hopefully in the near future. Um, but yes, it, international travel was actually the mainstay of Hanukkah magazine for various reasons uh, that include social political, actually, you know, on an international and national level, the government's trying to placate the international community by uh, spreading the yen around so that, you know, it wasn't such a focus that their assets were, you know, huge and their, um, their, their, their um, credit debt, you know, uh, relationship, that they were the second largest, you know, um, economy in the world. So they tried to spread the yen about. And I think women were vital in that strategy, whether they knew it or not. But uh, again, that's just, you know, for another time. So 
short answer is yes, absolutely. Okay, we have time for one more question, which is, can you further elaborate on the concept of East Asian femininity? What were the main attributes of modern Japanese women during the bubble period? Oh, that's such a difficult question. And it's something I think I'm sort of moving towards in my research. I do think it needs more time for me to think about. But for example, as I said, I outlined in my paper, Japanese femininity has traditionally been about being shy, being modest, you know, living at home with parents. And that was still very much part of reality. I think, however, because of the demands of international business, um, OLs, especially young Japanese women, were becoming encouraged more and more to be vivacious, um, cheerful, bubbly, but however, still good girls. So they could be flirty without giving up everything. And I think um, there is a wonderful book about bad girls of Japan, which touch upon more the history of bad girls, you know, in Japan, from the schoolgirl to whatever, um, all subversive kind of things. But predominantly, OLs were seen as being a good pick for, if it's from with a good company, good pick for their male colleagues to become you know, um, uh, married to. And it's something that actually manages, um, uh, created the, these pairings. In, if, they, if they found OL they liked, they would pair them with potential um, salary men who were their colleagues and that would stabilize them for the company. So there was a big, it was kind of um, part of a big social kind of industrial, you could say, or corporate strategy as well, of stabilizing the salary men and promoting Japanese economy forward. So the, importantly, the OL had to be cheerful, proficient in her job, well-educated, but not too risque um, and fun, of course. So that's what it was in the bubble for them. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Julie. That's a thank really you. interesting paper, particularly from my perspective, because I also work on female identity. So you and I have a lot more to chat about, I think. So thank you very much. <laughs> now. Um, I'd like to introduce, thank you. I'd like to introduce our final speaker for today. Her name is Una Lee, who's principal lecturer at the University of Brighton. Her research interests are design history and material culture in Korea and East Asia, transnational and cross-cultural studies of modernity, representations of national and personal identities, and political agency and cultural diplomacy of art and design. She is co-editor of an edited volume titled Design and Modernity in Asia from 1945 to 1990 with Dr. Miga Rajguru, who was our second speaker today. So I will now pass the mic to Yuna. Thank you, Sandy. So, okay, uh, so I'm going to, uh, my paper is about diligent helpers in the kitchen and thinking about and kitchen appliances in Korea. So I just have to uh, come declare the Korea, when I talk about Korea, it's actually, it, it's the Republic Korea, South Korea I'm talking about. Uh, so kitchen probably had gone through the most distinctive and rapid transformation amongst all the kind of home living spaces in Korea during the second half of the 20th century. So a modern kitchen uh, represented a functional and efficient working space for cooking and dining, and then symbolized the modern living style. So during 1970s and 80s, a new kitchen appliances and gadgets were introduced as uh, diligent helpers and promising the convenience and efficient use of cook, uh, for cooking and the joy and happiness to housewives and the family. So this talk is going to, uh, I'm going to explore the production and consumption of these new modern objects in the kitchen and in the context of rise of consumer culture in Korea during 1970s and 80s. So I will also look at the function and design of kitchen appliances and then how they were promoted through advertisement and then, and then some of the feature articles in news, women's magazine. So accommodating the new and modern kitchen objects in these uh, still evolving modern kitchen living spaces requires a new location for such devices and also often redeployment of the kind of cooking and dining living spaces. So I'm going to discuss some of those. And then finally, I'd like to reflect on the production and consumption of kitchen appliances within the context of growing consumer product industry in Korea and the formation of middle-class women's identity through this consumption. Ah, sorry. Um, 
So the, the sorry, I just, okay. So this uh, modernization of Korean kitchen uh, since the late 1950s uh, transformed the kitchen space for the many households. And then uh, it has been discussed by many Korean scholars as a symbol of modernization, which has swept through the nation since 1960s. So this evolved numerous new housing projects with improved provision of basic infrastructure and other facilities such as water supply, sewers and gas, electricity, oil for cooking and heating of the houses. So mid by mid 1970s, so many of these new houses, including newly built apartments, had been fitted with new modern kitchen with uh, the new configuration of this modernized uh, kitchen spa uh, spaces. And also it was uh, multiple new kitchen appliances were in, in, introduced and, and integrated into the organization of uh, kitchen space and everyday working of middle class households. So this feature article in the Household uh, Housewives Life magazine in 1975 shows these different kitchens with different sizes and use of uh, unit arrangement and use of uh, spaces for cooking and dining. So all of them shows the surface of worktops and cupboards brimming with uh, various kitchen appliances, as well as some of the crockery and utensils. So the ranges amount of these things uh, related to cooking and dining were increased very much notably during this period and reflecting growing consumer goods available and also public desire to consume them. So some of the example of actually appliances I'm going through very quickly. So this is uh, the, uh, uh, the some of the appliances for cooking. So the, the oil filled stove uh, become very popular during 1960s, replacing the old kind of furnace uh, and then using the kind of briskets and then kind of open fire cooking. And then later on in the during 1970s and gas, uh, particularly LPG development actually uh, very much encouraged in Korea and then become available to uh, the, the public from the early 1970s that uh, encouraged the uh, with, uh, introduction of this gas range. And firstly, uh, working with a Japanese company, Rinai, and then it set up Korean brands, is Korean Rinai, and, and then producing gas range from 1974. And then later on from 1978, they, uh, they start selling those gas ranges to Korean public as well. And then the many of the other companies like this one here, Kumsang, which is a gold star, and then uh, Samsung and many other companies follow the suit and then flooded the market with various kinds of gas ranges. And uh, the, another one is a refrigerator, as we all know, and refrigerator is very much actually uh, the, the kind of centerpiece of the uh, kitchen, but it was very slowly introduced to Korea. And then until even until the 1970s, refrigerator was very much imported item. And then, and it was very expensive to, to buy. And so it was still considered to be a symbol of wealth. And it's only up uh, when it comes to, uh, at the end of 1980s, it becomes most essential kind of item uh, and in, in the Korean kitchen. And the trouble of actually the refrigerator is a several things. And one is actually the location of it is very, because it's such a bulky and big object, it's very difficult to find the right places. So the, what this advertisement shows the kind of, a, or how the kitchen appliance has been actually arranged. And then the very corner of that, you can see the kind of fridge actually showing in there. But when you're actually looking at the, this installation, which is in Korean Museum and History Museum, which is actually coming from 1970s apartment, shows in, in reality, those kind of a, a space didn't really exist within the arrangement of kitchen space. So the, the, so house, uh, the housewives have to negotiate to find in those spaces. And some probably the most popular and the most kind of a widely used item uh, is electric cooker. And because the rice is very important uh, kind of cooking and the, the food in Korea, so rice cooker was you know, mostly widely used. Uh, and, and so introduction of rice cooker is again, actually related to the Japanese products. So Japanese Toshiba electric cooker was first invented in 1955, and then it was introduced in Korea from 1960, uh, mid of the 1960. 
And so the rice cooker has different kind of types. So this one on the left side is a cooker. And then on the right side, this is actually kind of a keeping warmth. So it's a thermal, the thermos that kind of a, it's a warmer. And then later on, and, and, and the Korean has developed something which actually does both of the rice cooker and the warmer both. So there has been some uh, uh, studies about these, uh, the cookers, which is uh, the uh, particularly LED game, the study really looking at the design, surface design and decoration of this, so particularly the rice warmer, which actually was very much kind of a container. And then looking at the, the, the comparing that with the, some of the Japanese design and particularly Japanese company called the Georgie Rush, which actually was very famous for their Maho bottle, which is actually th uh, th thermosis. And so the, the design of those flora pattern has been introduced possibly for, from the kind of Japanese those uh, thermosis, which was used for the tea drinking very much. And and then there is a, uh, another study is about probably use of plastics and then this pattern is really kind of related to kind of in the production state, uh, in the production states possibly try to uh, kind of hide some of the kind of uh, faults of the plastic. And those are very interesting thoughts, uh, which I, I need to explore a little bit more about that. And so these are the, so where these, uh, the uh, the rice cookers are uh, middle class. Uh, oh, sorry, so most of the studies of the uh, modern kitchen uh, development in middle class women's home home labor discuss the declining number of domestic helpers in this period. Is one of the uh, issues uh, middle class household has to address. And consequently, the organization of the kitchen is a space more open and integrated to the living space at home and kitchen appliances was promoted as a diligent helper to replace this domestic help with little effort and maximum convenience. So, and so emphasis on care and love associated with, with the cooking and the happiness of uh, the housewives and family was given in a visual representation like here, and then also textual rhetorics we can find in the text of the advertisements. And so the, the Korean, uh, the, so the Korean women, the, the, these housewives were to be modern by adapting to these changing conditions of the time with uh, the use of this, uh, uh, by consuming these new kitchen, modern kitchen uh, design and also modern kitchen appliances. And the modernity of the, uh, but also this modernity of a housewives in this modern kitchen, yet again bound with the gendered notion of space and labor, and then reaffirming women's places in a modern household as you can see here. And then by the kitchen counter as the master of the house management armed with the modern knowledge of design and technology. And it is actually then kind of uh, re replicated in other spaces in, in the house. And finally, and thinking about these, uh, the, the, the booming of these household appliances actually, you know, they're the putting in a context uh, of the Korean, uh, the consumer product and then industrial good development is a part of economic recovery plan and export drive which actually been uh, set up by the government from 1960s. And then in this process is uh, thinking about that the, the, the role of design become uh, uh, important in a way is actually do those big companies that come, you know, Samsung and Goldstar, all those kind of electronic companies we know now as a big international or global companies, they establish themselves and, uh, and then build their profile in industrial electronic consumer goods. And they started by copying and learning from Japanese uh, products and, uh, and other kind of international products and gradually uh, developing its own technology and design capacity. And then they also built uh, design research centers and then hiring designers which were actually who were graduating from the uh, newly established the, the design uh, university design uh, kind of a design university design education. And so these companies and, and 
then start providing probably the beginning of the industrial designing career. So in that sense, there's a, this uh, appliance is a, uh, is a very important part of studying Korean design in, and the development of industrial design in Korea. So that is kind of whizzing away the talk. So thank you very much. Thank you, Yuna. Um, before I ask any question from the audience, I have one that I don't know if it's directly related to your paper, but um, I come across some very sophisticated refrigerator design from Korea where they have a special compartment for kimchi. So when did that start? <gasps> when did that it's start? Amazing. Yeah, kimchi is called it. Uh, it's a popularly called as a dimche, and it's a company. Uh, uh, the Bando Winia is actually the company making dimche, and so there's an effort to try to make kimchi. Uh, a kimchi fridge actually started from uh, late seventies and early eighties, but it never really took off, and then it it kind of become popular again later on from the uh, the. Uh, 20s, actually 21st century, and it, it's related to we the kind of uh, the the lack of actually outdoor spaces where traditionally kimchi was stored in the kind of uh, outside uh, space in a kind of a uh, cold cold spaces in an outside, particularly over the winter. And so those uh, they, then then in the winter kimchi in Korea is actually is a kind of bulk production and then putting them in the normal fridge actually occupy too much space in the fridge. So then they develop this particular uh, kimchi which actually kind of maximize uh, the temperature for the kind of preserving kimchi for long period. And but also the use of the kimchi timche is really interesting because quite often actually you see that not just kimchi is a lot to lots of different kinds of Korean dried goods actually you found them in stored in those. And, and the location of actually the kimchi freeze actually become quite problematic, particularly if you li live in a smaller apartment or smaller houses because they are quite big. So they quite often they come into either come into the dining spaces or they actually taken out to the kind of verandas, which is kind of a utility which kind of used as an utility right next to kitchen often in Korean apartments. Okay, we have a question from an audience. Um, she finds it interesting that what these appliances are not, the old stove in the dark country kitchen access by going outside, um, jars holding hand, uh, homemade kimchi and condiments. So um, I think she wonders, are these contrasts assumed in the bright, shiny, middle-class imagery? Uh Yes, these are, you know, the images we're looking at is mostly are kind of a, they're very much actually aspirational and promotional images. So these are, it just doesn't really kind of, a, you know, always embody and kind of a represent of what was actually kind of a reality of everyday life of the women. And, and also we have to think about these are the kind of particularly some of the advertisement that shows the particular spaces in a particular housing. So for example, you know, the much of the kind of middle class uh, put, uh, kind of kitchens being, and particularly those kind of a fitted kitchen is, is kind of a, uh, assumed in a kind of apartment buildings and all new kind of newly built kind of a, uh, modern housing. So it doesn't actually really consider the kind of a traditional or modified uh, kind of, but more still very traditional housing stock. So, you know, quite often those coexisted for a long time in Korea and, and, and then still, you know, some of the place in the rural area does actually still have a very old fashioned kitchen. And then that means, the level is quite different. So kitchen is con was considered to be the outdoor space and it was outside. So you will have to get the shoes and cross the kind of uh, the courtyard to get to the kitchen. And rather than actually it is kind of same space as the your kind of uh, indoor living spaces. So, so there is a lot of different variations still, I mean, existed during those periods, particularly I'm talking about 70s and 80s, and still we see those kind of a remnant in different kind of a housing. Obviously, when it comes to housing for rural and you know, working class and very poor area, we are talking about quite different picture. The next question from this audience is, um, have you been doing any research into how women felt about these products and how they in interacted with them um, for 
instant memories, etc. And she wonders if they have different stories to tell, a bit like your example of the photo with the fridge that is hard to place in a real kitchen. Mm. And unfortunately, I since I start doing this part of it, because I the my main research about this project was actually really to do with the kitchen design and actually thinking about development of modular kitchen. And then this is comes as a kind of a sort of like a byproduct. It's kind of from, it's kind of furthering into actually the area of the kitchen and then and, and kitchen appliances. And so since then, and I've been stuck in UK and then I've been able to go back to Korea. So I didn't really have any chance to actually have a, you know, further research as a kind of a, you know, in that way, interviewing, finding out women's spaces. But there has been some studies done about it because there has been uh, some studies about actually interviewing people's uh, memories and experiences about these uh, kind of uh, housing developments and then the development of new kitchen and then in those stories actually they, these kind of how they use the kitchen appliances kind of mixed in so for example you know people didn't use the uh, fridge or kind of as a full-time kind of a, in the storage places for much until much later because it was very expensive and also they didn't feel they need to use it and they couldn't justify the cost of it. So they often actually kind of use it for the very kind of short period of time in the summer. And then they, you know, quite often I've, I've come across some of the pictures which actually put the fridge and, and refrigerator in the living room space. But then living room space is also, it's, it's much more com complicated, long kind of complex stories about how the living room evolves in Korea as well. And so living room is one of those places where it has been quite uh, multifunctional and then also working spaces in one way in Korean uh, housing. And then it has evolved with something quite different as a family room later. So the the kind of positioning of the fridge in those spaces become, you know, full, you know, part of those you know, kind of some of the examples about 70s and 80s, you can see those things happening in, in there. But that is a very good question. And I think that's something I really like to actually get into more about actually once I get to Korea. <laughs> Thank you, Yuna, for a fascinating um, look at the kitchen in um, Korea. So I think we have about um, less than 30 minutes left for our concluding discussion. So can all the speaker now um, join us so we can see you? First of all, I'd like to ask if you have questions for each other, this will be the uh, time to ask now. I wrote something in the chat, actually, Sandy, for you now. Thank you now for such a fantastic talk. After all of you, it was just amazing. I feel so enriched by it. Um, I wanted to know, you know, if there's a link between the de uh, development and modernization of the Korean kitchen mm. with uh, the Japanese mid-century living dining kitchen buildings, you know, the homes that were built for post-war mm. for Japan. I was wondering if, you know, just like with the rice cookers, if there's any kind of, um, you know, link between those or, or whether it was sort of developed, because I noticed those kitchens are actually separate from the living room, whereas in Japan, they were part mm. of the same, you know, space. So do, do um, yes, do let me know. Yeah, I mean, the it's a very peculiar thing about actually kind of chasing up actually where these things actually come from. So the, 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 the kitchen uh, renovation, a kind of modernizing kitchen actually has go back to the colonial times. So that goes back to 19, 20s, late 20s, 30s, and then that's very much actually kind of related to what happened in Japan as a kind of a building of the, you know, the new housing uh, stocks and then organize, reorganizing the living spaces. So it's definitely, in, and then all, all the kind of uh, the studies around the kitchen and the housing, and the, the actual references, a lot of the Japanese texts as well. And so, so this, this is very kind of strong kind of colonial legacy and then also kind of geographically very close to each other. So they, there is a very strong kind of a lineage to that. And, but none of the kind of scholarly works talking about the development of the kitchen and also none of the reports actually, because there was a, the kind of housing association, Korean housing association produced endless report about this. And none of them mentioned directly to the Japanese uh, kitchen development in either 
kind of uh, 1920s and 30s or 1950s directly in those kind of documents. It's only very recently for, for the probably not, you know, last about 10 years actually, and the scholars going back to the materials from the kind of uh, 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 the 30s and modern development, and then looking into the relations between Japan and Korea more closely. And that's where the kind of more studies coming out through that way, but the 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 all the kind of a uh, the report and books I looked at publication I looked at there isn't really direct mention of Japanese kitchen in those there, periods yeah was there possibly a tension around admitting perhaps <laughs> um, considering the history there's a bit of tension around you know yeah I think I think if there may be you know that kind of historic kind of a uh, legacies and then tensions around it is definitely played a part and but. Uh, but then also the, the kind of recording of how the, these kind of appliances brought in Korea and then how closely that's related to Japanese product is also been you know, written and quite uh, kind of a widely publicized in the, you know, all the kind of museum websites and government report and, you know, those, uh, those histories are written in such a way. So, so I think that's definitely changing in a way. And and then it's more about thinking about what are the relationships, uh, the kind of interactions, which then prompt this kind of, a, you know, objects become available in Korea and also kind of taken a kind of certain type of development in Korea has become more, more of the concern rather than thinking about where it's actually come from and then what that means really, yeah. Hopefully that explains a little bit. Yeah, no, absolutely, yeah. thank you, yeah. Any questions between or amongst ourselves? Otherwise, I have one for Miga. Um, and I'm also speaking from my perspective in Hong Kong, because whenever the government or some developer try to, I don't know, rebuild or reorganize some area for the working class or the graduate people, um, there are always differences of opinion. The, the people generally don't like being imposed on. So what's the sentiment with the um, people that the buildings or, or the structures that you're talking about, what, what, how do they feel about that? Um, I, I, I know about the project in Mumbai <clears throat> and um, the people that there's mixed, mixed sentiment. Some people say that they love being there because it's in it's in Mumbai and it is not um, high rise. They live in a space which is much more uh, like a rural setting, so they see that space as um, idyllic almost for for themselves. But others not so much. Very critical of the constraints of the spaces. Um, very critical of how. Um, they, they feel almost stuck <clears throat> with what they have um, because if, and this is something similar to other research I've done about uh, when people design their own homes is, the, you know, they can control how they create their environment. Um, Korea's intention was that, but that is not how it played out um, because essentially he's creating a blueprint, which is not, which is flexible to a certain extent, but it is also pretty rigid. So. Um, I would say that in this particular context, this is what is going on. But beyond this project, um, there are definitely other discourses, discussions happening around, um, you know, the slums in Mumbai and, and so on. Um, but that's a different sort of discussion. Thank you. Now, um, I'm waiting sort of for the audience to give more thought to the question. I have one, though, that um, came from the previous five minutes for um, Huying. Um, this audience says that it seems like Hanata is providing a window for the Japanese female audience outwards, almost like a view to the um, Occident. Do you think the magazine plays a role in being a window into the Orient, such as us looking into Japan through the lens of the magazine now? So it's sort of the, I don't know, your, your East West <laughs> Uh, sorry, I do you mean about Hanako now, or do you mean me? Because I've only studied the Hanako issues from that period of time, which is the economic. Yes, well, I, I, think, I think he meant then, you know. Right. 
Okay. Sort of the east-west yeah. issue. Um, that's a really interesting question. Um, so Hanako magazine, although it's predominantly about leisure, is about also um, education of their demographic. And it was also, um, a lot of it was focused on travel. So, and it's not just, however, international travel, but also domestic travel. And it wasn't meant for foreign consumers to, to read. It was um, for a female Japanese audience. And Japanese magazines are very segregated and they have very specific targeted demographics. So it definitely was read by office ladies. Um, although I have heard from one of the interview participants that she used to read some men's magazines to get an insight into what men were thinking at the time. So, you know, but whether salary men were reading Hanukkah, I very much doubt it because there's issues of masculinity tied up with accessing women's literature and all that kind of thing, perhaps, you know, for, for Japanese men at the time. However, um, so, ja yeah, so Hanukkah was meant for Japanese women to read and educate them on not necessarily uh, literature or, or academic subjects, but more about where to go shopping, where to find the best restaurants, where to go in Paris. But it's not necessarily always to look at museums, but where you can, you know, where you might find the Chanel shop or et cetera. And they would put, you know, put in lots of maps and, you know, places to see. And likewise, there's whole issues dedicated to visiting Kyoto. Or um, if we're talking about Orientalism, I, do, I have sort of written before, previously my research about them at, um, you know, having issues on places like visiting not just Hawaii, but Thailand and Malaysia, you know, as, uh, as tourists. And Japanese tourism at that time was booming, but it was actually part of a concerted government program to push Japanese consumers out there as international tourists. And we see that reflected all over the place, not just from, you know, the facts and figures, but also culturally, we see the Japanese tourists becoming a big feature in American movies of the time. So, you know, it, it becomes a stereotype of the camera, you know, clicking tourist. So, um, yes, so so uh, Hanako magazine, I'm using it as a window into the Japanese female psyche of the time. That's true. And through that, I did define not just how they viewed the West or viewed the East or whatever that might be, but actually how they viewed themselves and how they were, they're both participants in creating this, but also um, educated in it. So they were being given these templates by which they were presented what they should do. When you go to Paris, you go do these things. You go to the Chanel shop, you buy lots of things. You go you try that wine, you know, and you go to the boulangerie here and there. Um, when you go to London, you have high tea at the Ritz. This is what you do. So they were cultural educators as well. So, but they also had letters columns and, places to go in Tokyo and, you know, women would write in about their problems and all sorts. So they're both reflector and educator, if that makes sense. Women both conform to the type and they set the material as well. Okay. Hope that um, well. We have a question for Stacy. Are there particular fashions for reassembling shards earlier in history than the modern and the postmodern period? Or is this kind? Is this practice kind of symptomatic of these particular periods in some ways? Um, well, the way I presented it, it probably seemed like it was very contemporary practice um, and you know confined to East Asia. But in fact, um, if we look at it strictly through the material, um, there is a long history of using East Asian ceramics, starting with Chinese, um, as medium for making other objects. Um, in cultures beyond East Asia. Um, I'm thinking, for example, of the Ottoman world um, and the use of Chinese ceramics and broken ones as well as whole ones to create new Ottoman style objects um, and the redecorating them with um, in in by the court jewelers, for example. And this is this is happening, you know, in the 16th century. So one sees it in the same material um, really being used across cultures, but that mirrors, of course, the kind of global consumption and trade in that material. Um, so I don't know if that answered your question, your that question. Um, what was the second part of the question? Um, that is this practice kind of symptomatic of these particular period in some way. So I guess particular to modern and contemporary. 
Um, I think, no. I mean, if one looks at it, you know, from a long historical perspective, I, I can't say that it is. I mean, there are certain, um, certain approaches within it um, that are of their time and place. Um, one that, you know, emerges that really spreads quite a lot is, is the use of, um, and this whole idea of um, kintsuji, you know, decorated repair is something that really spreads um, and has been, you know, it, and it, if you look at it through, um, you know, a modern lens, um, it has actually had somewhat of a revival, but then if that parallels interest in things, you know, in Japan, for example, um, and in, you know, um, further romanticizing of, you know, perceived cultural attitudes towards things like tea ceramics. So um, I don't know that it's specific to one time and place, but it definitely mirrors um, um, wider cultural activity in time period, in certain time periods and places. Thank you. Um, we have a question for Xingling. How do the Japanese women feel about the beauty pageant? Um, because it seems that the beauty pageant culture comes from the US in the 1950s. So how do women in the 80s felt about it? Um, is it new body image that empowering women or something else? So from, um, from my research, I haven't really looked into beauty pageants per se and how you know the Japanese women thought about that. However, it's, it's a complex, um, relationship that the sort of ordinary young single, can I just say, Japanese woman has with uh, feminism, I guess you could say. One of my research interview subjects um, was an OL in Panasonic in the 80s. And she, in our interview, she talks about how they, you know, she was very proud of the fact that she came top in her class, her, her etiquette class, and she was redeployed to one of the most lucrative departments, you know, in Panasonic. Matsushita, I think, um, uh, investments or something like that to you know serve tea to clients and be their front face they had a line of jackets that they needed some to model so they got their ols to model them for the clients you know and um and she sort of both laughed at that and felt it was uh something to be proud of that they were seen as, as so elegant it was part of their cachet their their capital so to speak and office ladies knew know, know this and they knew this at the time that their um, beauty and their qualification, so to speak, you know, if they came from a respectable family, if they went to a good university, they, it would improve their marriage potential. Um, and this would set them for a good life. So these things were important to them and they were very realistic about it. And, you know, there was a pressure to enjoy themselves before having to give up their work for marriage and maternity. Um, there's this one famous M curve of the Japanese employment where, you know, the peak of it is where women go to work immediately after university or college, but then it declines their employment as they, you know, get married, and then it rises again as they search for work after the children go to school. It's quite normal, but often this work isn't in high status corporations anymore, but it's actually in places like supermarkets, you know, uh, convenience stores and so on and so forth, and it's part-time work. So um, women were very uh, realistic actually about that. And they, they knew that this was really um, part, of, part of the game, you know, part of their social contract, that they could enjoy themselves at work, that they could go exploring, that they could have this bubbly fun, but all predicated on the fact that it would be short lived, that they wouldn't be given responsibilities deliberately so that because they weren't expected to have a career. Um, so I think in the previous question that was asked about, you know, what, how, what was their kind of characteristics of the bubble, I would actually, I was thinking about it, and I think that they represent one side of the bubble, they were bubbly, flirtatious, fun-loving, consumers, um, enjoyed themselves a lot, um, but it was short-lived, you know, and they had this short-lived um, sort of, you know, social life and leisure life before they, they had to knuckle down and become housewives. And the salary men actually is just another side of my research I look at, represent the other side of the economic bubble, which is all about the frenetic hard work and the economic, you know, corporate masculinity going on. So both of them kind of represent both sides of the bubble and they characterize it. So I hope that answers the question. Yes, thank you. Okay, we have two questions that are for all the speakers. So I'm just gonna read out the first one, which is slightly, Shorter. Um, 
this audience wants to know about models of democracy and different ways in which people can own a piece of something. What are the differences between the different places, times, and design culture that we've been hearing about this afternoon? So um, can we start with Miga, maybe? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, thinking about India in, in those years, um, in the post-colonial years, I think democracy was absolutely crucial. It was absolutely at the heart of discussions around what a post-colonial nation would look like. And within that context, um, the reason why I'm focusing on um, the class of what were called described as the poor is because they were absolutely at the central, um, formed a central place in this discussion about the democratic nation um, and what they had access to, what they did not have access to, but also their political um, input within the democracy. So in order for, um, and this carries on in fact, beyond 1990 that I'm looking at, that in order for someone to vote, in the democratic system, they needed to have some form of education and understanding. Um, and in, in order for them to even be on the road to regist register, they needed to have a space. So the idea that the, the notion of address, the notion of stability um, becomes really important in shifting the debate around impermanent homes and permanent homes. So I think um, there is a lot of really interesting theoretical and post-colonial literature about democracy and rights, but I think in the case of the two places, the projects I referred to, um, democracy could happen through um, making choices about how they expand their living spaces, about how they um, own their living spaces. And this was, as it were, given to them as an option. I think I'm going to stop there. It can be a very long answer and it's a very interesting question, but I think hopefully that answers the question. Okay, um, Yuna? Uh, it's a, such a good question and I've, I've been thinking about it and I think in a way democracy is actually really quite interesting question when we're looking at that period of, uh, of Korean history in 1960s, 70s and 80s, you know, up until probably to 21st century, because in one way it's kind of a, in a, in a shape, it kind of, it, it, it's a military government which actually has a long history of a governing in Korea and then which even though it has a kind of a democratic uh, kind of form of democratic uh, election, but actually in, in, in a sense, actually it wasn't really a democratic society in those periods I'm looking at. And so in one way, actually, the, the democratic model in Korea was very much actually looking towards to America. And then this is a, the time actually American culture, American kind of political and economic actually system had a huge impact on the Korean society and how Korea actually was very much actually built. Uh, by the guidance and support from America. So, so kind, of, kind of owning those uh, the places with the modern kitchen uh, design and spaces arranged and then owning those appliances is, is a part of the ways actually assuring people about actually kind of a, uh, kind of having an assurance about you are part of actually kind of this uh, developing uh, kind of modern kind of culture where you can claim your places within this modern society. And, but also in a way, the, what, what much of the actually kind of historians kind of debates about this, uh, the illusion of consumer culture, and then disguise that in a fundamental kind of economic, political kind of structure, which actually really Kind of oppressed people and and then that continued for much much long time and so in one way it's it's very much actually kind of a kind of a, the the two sides of the coins in a sense actually it does have its uh, kind of very shiny surface but it also has a very complex and very complicated and actually you know quite uh, difficult to resolve that theory kind of uh, issues behind it and and i guess that's and probably that's probably where I stop actually, I guess. Okay. Um, Stacy. So well, with respect to my specific topic, I'm not sure that democracy is the political frame I would look at it through, but that's not to say that politics doesn't factor into it, especially if we look towards the archaeology um, and the politics of archaeology in China, um, which is a really interesting subject. 
Um, and also ideas about archaeology and nationhood and representations of nationhood and representations of the past um, and using material from the past to establish present day identities and political um, allegiances. Um, that is you know, a huge topic that I would love to explore in more depth, but I think in particular, we need to think about, and I'm just going to borrow a phrase from James Cuno, um, with respect to shards, particularly archaeology material, who owns the past? And certainly there are different ideas about that if one goes in, looks at different national approaches at the moment. You know, um, mm. For example, the way it's framed in Britain is totally different from the way it is in China. Thank you. And Julian? Okay, um, yeah, so the idea of democracy, I mean, I think I would reframe it for my, my area in terms of equality, because I'm talking specifically about gender. However, in the wider um, environment of the bubble, I really like Yuna's idea that things were illusionary and that this idea of consumption and illusion go on. And it's very similar with Japan. On the one hand in the bubble, you know, it felt like they were ascending to become world dominant leader in economics and therefore politics. Um, only for it to sort of crumble, you know, and realize it's all been a sham by like 89 onwards. Uh, and it leads to nearly two decades of recession, the lost decades. Um, in terms of women, the idea of equality was sort of felt like it was really there, you know, um, not only were, you know, living standards supposedly going up, people were earning more, but also we had things like the EOL, the Equal Employment Opportunities Law, that said women should have equal rights at work, etc., or that they should have equal opportunities. Did it translate in practice? It was a toothless law. It had, you know, no company would penalize. Only 1% of women went on to do managerial track work. The rest um, went, were automatically shifted to administrative clerical work. Um, you know, and the rotation was high that, you know, their sort of, um, you know, wages were kept low. Um, you know, and some things were rolled back, some privileges, like women at the time um, were given before them, which uh, it was quite often they could have menstrual leave, for example, when they had period, they could stay at home, you know, if, if they, they were ill with it, however, or, or not very well, but this was actually rolled back under the law, the companies got rid of that, they scrapped it. So, um, and what we had instead was, to, instead of, you know, um, hard rights for women, we get all these soft rights. So, oh yes, if you know you don't feel well, you can go home, uh, you can go off and use all your holiday, you know, the company will informally pay for you things. So the men would pay for the women to take them out for drinks, treat them for lunch, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it gave this illusion of freedom, this illusion of equality, this illusion of um, leisure and, and disposable income. But the fact remains that, you know, the actual uh, working conditions for women and then when they left, their prospects when they left and they were, you know, usually had a tap on the shoulder to leave. That's, you know, um, a phrase that was used. That meant they were getting too old. They had to get married and go. Um, you know, things didn't actually change for women. So in terms of democracy, was, you know, the bubble was an illusion in so many ways other than its economy. And we're still feeling the aftereffect today. Thank you. Now, um, I think we have time just for one more question and quick answer. And I think all of you can see the Q&A box, right? It's that very long one, but I'm going to paraphrase a little bit because I think this audience is concerned about what we've been talking about. You know, there's a lot of Japan and Korea connection in Japan and China similarities. So for all of you, where and when do you see the sources for people you write about um, reference or reach out to other sources in Asia more broadly and comprehensively as compared to specific borrowing from one other country and as compared to the default reference to the US or Europe. So I guess this is about cross-cultural referencing and you do always hear about Japan and China or, or Japan and Korea or sometimes it just must be the West. So what's your thought on that? We have about five minutes for this. Can we start with um, Niga again? 
Yeah, sure. <clears throat> I think when I when I look to references, I look to I I see India within the global south as much as I see it in, in Asia. Um, but the people I'm looking at are exactly the same. Um, India is positioned in the global south by international development agencies. Often, its um, positions are positioned as the third world um, in the politically in the third world, but also developmentally in the third world um, and oftentimes or many times in Asia spiritually um, and this is not just in a post-colonial period it is also in the pre-colonial uh, period um, you know Indian modernism is intertwined with Asia as much as it is with um, Europe um, yeah okay uh, Yuna Yeah, so, so I did talk quite a lot about Mexican and Korean Japan relationship and obviously there, you know, the Korea was very uh, closely tied to the American and USA and, and it's, it's aid and then, you know, other kind of a lifestyle and influences as well. And in terms of actually thinking about Asia, and there were some uh, the kind of interactions with uh, the countries like uh, the Iran and kind of Middle East. Actually, Middle East become quite important place in terms of actually Korean architects actually working with Middle East companies and Middle East where they actually having a, a, in, a, a kind of building boom. So, so there is a, some a, a, there's some interactions about actually kind of a people who are going crossover and they're working together and then that they are building the big kind of a national projects. And the in terms of like, thinking about the Western Europe and Western Europe more particularly, and uh, there are some references to to kind of developing kitchens uh, following some European models, and then particularly kind of importing some of the uh the kind of technology and machineries from the western germany actually that i saw in some places so in, in relation to kitchen development and also interestingly uh, in relation to cosmetics development as well in the early korea i mean early like it's in the 50s and 60s and then they were actually bringing some really kind of the machinery to make a kind of powders actually for face and so those are the kind of some of the kind of a pacific uh, specific kind of references i saw so far, yeah. Okay, um, Stacey? Um, well, I think this kind of applies less to my topic than say the others, but just briefly, I would say looking at, looking at ceramic culture, um, you know, within East Asia, there are effectively kind of two modes. Um, there's the traditionalist mode that is very much monocultural um, and very national. And then there's the more contemporary mode, which is much more cross-cultural and it's, it's actually appropriation from outside that is more noticeable than within. However, I am somewhat universalizing by grouping the three um, nations or regions together. Um, but this is a pattern that has been persistent for, for many, many years. And it, you know, there are a lot of reasons for it that I won't go into here, um, mm -hmm. but it's a very noticeable kind of um, um, parallel approach within one's craft medium. And do position in which history with the rest of Asia problematic um, as a, you know a historical aggressor. And I think it's very and you know and it also links to the 1960s demonstrations where you know there was a kind of more liberal movement going on and wanting to recognize these things. So I think by the 80s when Japan's are feeling like its ascent into the you know economic and global atmosphere, it kind of wants to really talk about its history with other nations in that sense. However, um, you know, in women's magazines in Hanako, it's uh, it's very shallow actually. It's much like they love the rest of the world, but in framed in terms of tourism and consumption, and it's places to enjoy and to spend money. It's in the men's magazines actually that you see this more cultural nuance, and also in politics and industry. So, but the rest of the world is very important for Japanese economy, um, at, but. It changes in the 80s when sort of Japan saying yes, say Akio Mori um, of, of Sony writes um, the book Japan that can say no, and that became a really big deal that Japan could suddenly say no to the rest of the world. Um, and likewise, there was still fe strong feeling about it. I think in politics, 
um, one of the opposition politicians said, Korea is not Japan's sex toilet when it came to uh, building tourist industries and gambling places for Japanese tourists to go to in Korea. And that creates a huge shockwave um, politically. So I do think there is this tangled history that Japan has with the rest of the world that actually needs further looking at of the period. Hmm. Well, I think we are just right on time. Um, so this wraps up our session today. Um, thank you very much for everyone's hard work and really, really interesting research. And then we'll have uh, day two tomorrow, also starting at 9.30 um, in the morning, New York time and different times where we are. And then for those of you who are available, um, please come back as audience. And then um, we will also have this um, summarizing discussion after the final paper. And then we can have sort of a, a sort of a concluding discussion amongst all of us. So thank you very much. And thank you for those of you who joined us today in the audience. We really appreciate it and hope to have you again here tomorrow. So thank you and goodbye. Bye bye. So this is day two of the symposium. And yesterday we had a very productive session. Um, four speakers spoke about um, uh, East Asian ceramic culture, um, working class interior and public space in India, um, magazine in 1980s Japanese bubble economy and the consumption of kitchen appliances in Korea. And we're gonna have four more papers today and hopefully another day of food pro discussion. And um, the presentation starts with me. So let me just share screen first. So I'm Sandy Ng, and I'm Assistant Professor of Culture and Theory and Design Strategy Deputy Specialism Leader in the School of Design of the Hong Kong Polytechnic University. My um, research focus mainly on modern art and design and material culture. I'm currently doing a project that um, scrutinized design, gender, and modern living in 20th century China, particularly focusing on how modern women introduce modern design and lifestyle, and in turn change on um, material culture and redefine their um, female identity, um, especially in the Republican period. So what I'm going to talk about um, right now in the next 10 minutes, let me time myself, um, it's part of that project and it's pretty rough, so please bear with me. Um, now, I came across this when I was doing this project. Um, this is a quote from the writing of Lu Sun. Um, he's famous for writing about um, all the different challenges and difficulties in modern China. And it's one of his essay, um, unfortunately translated as anxious thoughts on natural breasts. He says this, um, a woman has so many parts to her body, life is very hard indeed. And his anxious thoughts about natural breasts actually refers to the fact that um, women didn't just find their foot, they also found their breasts. And at this time, they were also liberated from that. Now, um, he had no problem with women being liberated. He was all for it, but he thought that the society wasn't ready for it. And um, so all over, um, urban city in the early 20th century China, um, this is what you see most often. Women in Chi Pao, that's very revealing or evocative. And um, I have actually read document that um, sometimes women did receive verbal or physical attack because of the way they're dressed. Hence, a lot of intellectuals at the time were very wary about um, the liberated body. So here are some of the key concepts that I want to explore um, in the project and very, very briefly today um, in a few minutes. Um, fashion actually, um, for me, refers to the most admired style of clothes and bodily adornments. It is the cultural construction of the embodied identity and bodily adornments such as jewelry enhance self-identity and social position and give the individual a certain status. Identity formation is a material process through which continuous changes are made. Women appropriate meanings of clothing and accessories into their lives. An acquisition of possession is highly related to the concept of an extended self. Design defines women's sense of who they are and express their identity. And finally, design plays a key role in the symbolic projection of the self. An individual in search of a self must have to accumulate appropriate symbols of the new self and design revised self-concept in the direction of how a person views the ideal self 
and the characteristic of the design articulate the newfound self. So instead of just looking at dress, I also want to look at other um, fashionable items such as something like this that's portrayed in this um, calendar posters. And we have plenty of examples that actually exist, which, which it doesn't surprise me, but I think the number of it does. Um, this is actually not an evening bag um, to correctly categorize it. It's a necessary, which is a small ornamental case for cosmetic, pencil, scissors, tweezer, and other small items. And you would be surprised how much you can put in it. It's really quite small. Um, the point is that um, I think women in this period, they use this kind of item not only to express their wealth, but to also express their identity, that they actually want to be seen, they want to be visible. And usually this type of item is made of very luxurious material like gold, enamel, and diamond that sort of further appeal and attract um, spectatorship. Sometimes women would also use this, um, especially in the evening. This is called compact, but don't think of compact in sort of the contemporary sense. This is almost like a tiny, tiny purse because sometimes you have the powder, you can put the lipstick, you can even put other very, very small items. And as you can see, it's also made of very luxurious um, and expensive um, item. Now, um, cosmetic case of many different kinds existed back in history. And of course, we have a few here in this very famous painting of court ladies. And this is just an historical example, because in my research, I actually talk about comparison between um, historical example and contemporary example. So this is an historical example. The major difference is, um, I don't think women at that time took these outside of um, the um, domestic environment. What interests me is also the motif on this type of design. This is in fact a landscape. So this is quite interesting for the woman who use it. If it's a Chinese woman, for instance, it um, connects her back to her heritage, a kind of tradition. If a European woman use it, it express her knowledge of an other culture. And this must have been a very, very popular design because I actually found four variations made of different colors and different um, materials, but all really quite small. And we know that women use this kind of um, English vanity case because I found this one, it's designed for Song Meiling, who, as most of you know, she was known for her fashion, sometimes deemed quite extravagant. And um, so this is one with her name and grades, and this is in the very stylish and simple Art Deco style. This actually includes a clock. And as a side note, I thought this is a really interesting um, photograph because if we are thinking in line of women expressing themselves through um, what they wear and what they use, um, I think this is a very interesting picture of Eleanor Roosevelt, who was known for her commitment to social cause, not for her fashion. But here, I think knowing she would meet a fashionable um, first lady of sort, um, she also dressed especially to almost reassert her identity to be her equal. So I find that actually quite interesting. And of course, um, in the early 20th century, the flappers are everywhere. These were liberated women. They, they drank in public, they danced, um, they were free from the corset, they, they actually um, drove cars. And they were also in sort of the, the Chinese cultures as well. Um, I just have two interesting photographs. Um, the, this is um, Butterfly Wu, a very well-known actress at the time. And I actually found lots of photographs, women sort of posing, um, in this case, also on a vehicle, sometimes in the vehicle. And here we have um, a, uh, the well-known Chinese-American actress, and Mei Wong, actually dressed in a flapper style dress. So when I came across this type of design, this is another necessary, I don't just take it as, oh, it's interesting to have a car shape necessary. I think for the woman who owned this and used this at the time, it literally symbolized her liberation, her, her freedom that um, she could drive, she could be in the car, she could actually leave the domestic um, environment. And um, this is a picture of uh, Shanghai nightlife. And this is also quite typical of the period of um, people going out dancing. So literally women expressing themselves and almost flaunting um, their, their bodies. 
And in terms of the flapper's style, um, she is wearing a chi pao, but actually the chi pao is made in the style of um, the flapper dress. And here we have an example by Gabriella Chanel. And of course, women actually, I think um, in cosmopolitan city like Shanghai, they did go out a lot. So it's always interesting to see how they adorn themselves to assert that um, identity, that femininity. So here we have uh, a poster of a woman. Um, I think she's about to go out. She's almost flamboyantly dressed. And um, I found an evening bag that's quite like the one that she's holding. And what interests me here is how the woman is portrayed. Her hand, her right hand, I think it's thin and large so that you actually focus on her adornment, the, the evening bag and the, the huge ring. I mean, if you compare the proportion of the two hands, they, they're not really um, alike. And then of course, in terms of dressing, um, this is the final example I'm gonna talk about. I thought about ladies dressing table, also categorized as vanity, because if you actually look at Necessaire and all these other women's adornment items, they are always categorized as um, vanity. So this is one type of vanity. And it's the only type of furniture that is designed and made exclusively um, for women rather than um, men. Now, women in the past did have something similar like this type of cosmetic chest with folding mirror and stand, but this is sort of very transitional. You know, a woman could use it almost anywhere. Whereas this, I would try to argue that it literally marks her physical space. And of course, this whole notions of reflection, which is something that I am um, also working on as well. Um, I think it's really interesting. It's because I also found lots of photos of women doing this, exactly what you're looking at, sort of uh, uh, being very self-aware, but also being very self-reflective at the same time. And I think it has to do with um, the, the whole concept of looking, the gaze, and then the, the return of both of those. So women were very self-aware, but they were also surrounded by images that they could actually um, uh, they could actually look at like like this. They were surrounded by printed material, poster that were um, hung on the wall. So in in a lengthier version of um, this part of my discussion, um, I'm I would be going on to photographs because I would try to argue that all that I just spoke about very very quickly actually changed the. Um, way women view themselves and it, it gave them more confident and that confidence is exhumed in photographs and I, I have two um, right here that you're looking at. You have women directly looking back and um, gazing back at the camera, gazing back at the um, spectator. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Okay, so I think the question for me will come in this box, which I think from yesterday's experience, we should give it a minute or two because it sometimes takes people time to write. So um, I don't know if the panel um, has any question for me that I can answer. Oh yeah, there, there, yeah. There is one question from Yuna Lee, and they, uh, it says, where are these luxury modern objects in Hong Kong museums? Yes, um, well, because of the current situation, I've only been able to actually um, look at um, example in Hong Kong, and they're in this museum called Langhi Museum um, in Hong Kong. They have a very, very large collection of um, the quote unquote vanities. Um, I can send you the um, web link to the museum if you want, you know. Mm. So, and can I just follow up on that, my question? I just wondered about actually who are the makers of those objects and then, you know, how it was kind of made within Hong Kong or maybe mainland China and brought to Hong Kong or kind of imported from abroad and things like that? No, actually, most of the luxurious items, like the ones that I've shown, they were made by um, European makers like Cartier, Van Cliff and Arpels. Um, but we, I don't have photographs of it, but I have actually come across documentation that women did have imported products in mainland China um, at, at the time that they, they would use. Um, Shanghai especially was a very wealthy city, so they could afford um, imported um, products.
products. So, okay. Now, I'm looking at the questions, so I, I should read them out. For, so I have one question for the evening bag with Chinese style embroidered butterfly and other motif. Was this a repurpose Chinese embroidery or was it created specifically for this piece? Did Chinese artists make components of European made um, accessories? So, um, okay. And then somebody says, this looked like repurposed Chinese embroidery to me. Um, did I show actually? I, did I actually show an evening bag? Let, let me actually check. Okay, so to make this really quick, and actually I time myself because I only get now three minutes. I think. Um, I think the ones that I've come across, they haven't been really purpose, um, as far as I know, but um, some of them might have been um, repurposed, especially if they are um, textile. So I hope I hope I answered your um, questions. Okay, do I have more questions? Okay, I think I have a question here in the chat box. Okay, okay I answer that. How much, okay, how much did these filter down to the middle classes or were they solely for the upper classes? Okay, um, I think the most luxurious one, they were mostly for the elite, but um, I think uh, less expensive copies were made available for the, the middle classes. And of course, then they would go into um, secondhand markets. And the other question is, how much were the middle classes aware of these items and were they aspirations for them? I, I think women, the, the general sentiment I get from my research is that women aspired to be better. And the way they did that is through actually dressing themselves better because I actually came across um, documentation about even women from rural area. Um, they might have gotten, um, you know, pictures or, or images of women in the urban city and how they are dressed. And they would try to mimic that the best way they could using whatever resources um, they, they, they could get their hands on. So it is quite interesting. I mean, I, I thought about how these items that I presented today are mostly very luxurious and for the elite, but they become a kind of ideal for all women to aspire to. Okay, so, oh, I have more questions. Um, so, let's see. Ah, okay, I have a question here. It's your scope limited to only Asian and Western culture. How about other interesting community like Egyptians, um, uh, where women are thought to have had rich fashion and material culture like worn nail extensions way back 3000 BC. Now I thank you for that question, but the project I'm doing mainly focus on um, uh, Chinese women, but in the future, I might broaden that and to include a comparison to um, other culture. And um, okay, then I have another pick. Oh, the other question I'm getting is in my opinion, how does social status influence the self-identity of women, especially those who can't afford the luxury items? Um, that's actually a really good question. I think this is why I, I said earlier on that even for those who couldn't afford the luxurious item, they would try to mimic that. They, they would try to almost copy that to almost like, yes, I can't afford it, but I'm showing a sense of what's trendy, what's fashionable lately, that um, I, I'm aware of what's going on. So, um, but yeah, I think social status influence um, the self-identity of women a, a great deal. And okay, I think I have time for one more question. Okay. Okay. This question asked, um, I was wondering if you also found these necessary being included in photographic portraits of the time to denote modernity 
of the woman um, portray or is it mainly in poster um, or advertisement? Now, I've actually been looking to see um, how often these necessary uh, were portrayed. I haven't found them being portrayed with women in photographs, but I'm gonna keep looking because I, I have a feeling because they were so popular, they, they must have been included somehow. Okay, so I think that's the end of my own um, five minute Q&A. I have a lot more questions, which I might actually um, answer um, through typing. So um, let me move on to our next presenter, who is, let me get my paperwork correct. And Sarah, I hope you are ready. So our next presenter is Sarah Zhang, who is sharing her um, screen now. She is a head of program for the History of Design Department at the Royal College of Art London. Her research and teaching focuses on East Asian fashion history, gender, and the body with a special interest in fashion exchanges between China and Britain and on fashion, race, and cultural expression. She's a founding member of the Research Collective for Decolonizing Fashion and the Open Research Initiative. She has published widely on the um, presence of Chinese material culture in Britain in the early 20th century and on transnational histories of hair and fashion. She recently co-edited a volume of essay entitled Rethinking Fashion Globalization and we published in the summer of 2022. So I will now mute myself and let Sarah Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, great. And thank you also, Sandy, for um, setting up a lot of the historical context for my paper. I almost feel like my paper is like the second part of your paper. So that's fantastic. And I can't wait to talk to you about it later as well. Um, okay. Fashion is an emphatically transnational form of modernity, responsible for a constant recycling of motifs and materials in pursuit of contemporaneity and expressions of self. Fashions in dress create embodied, visceral, material experiences of local, national and cosmopolitan subjectivities. And these operate on a complex both and basis. They are local and they are global. They are made of the past and they make the present. They remake the past in order to make the modern sensorium. Focusing on the transnational and on textile objects that lend themselves to constant change and reuse as they move from one context to another, our attention is drawn to the indeterminate, the culturally fuzzy and the opaque as important factors. And these are themes I've been exploring in my most recent work. And this paper attempts to draw a few areas together relating to 20th century fashion history. So my paper considers narratives of displacement and material and cultural fluidity to rethink any grand narratives about Asian fashion and modernity and in particular Chinese fashions, as they've been understood within British fashion history. So when starting to think about Chinese fashions from Britain, I am thinking today about three key areas. First, a continuum of motifs across various surfaces in the home, as well as the body, and a continuum of geographies. For example, silk embroidered pajama sets, where images evoking Chinese landscapes or dragons were constantly moving across wallpapers, soft furnishings, clothing, graphic design, etc., in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. And on the left, you can see a pajama set in the collections of the VA Museum. And al although the place of the manufacture of the pajamas is not known, the hand stitching and the floss silk embroidery thread make it likely that these were made in China. However, intriguingly, the object history of these pajamas states they were used and may have been purchased by a British couple in what was then termed Burma in the 1920s and 30s. Burma becomes another possible point of origin, an area that borders China and at that time was part of British India. And we can note that pajamas are also a garment type associated with South and West Asia. Next to these, you can see a pajama set in the collections of Brighton Museum, and they're almost exactly matching pair. The quality of embroidery in the Brighton set is far higher, implying that the place of manufacture for the base garment could have been the same, but the place and heritage of the hand of the embroiderer could have been very different. This prompts questions about the identity of the embroiderers working on objects that sit between China and Europe. In China in the 1920s, as Sandy has been saying, society was in political and economic turmoil and clothing cultures were undergoing some radical shifts. In Europe, trouser wearing was also extremely radical for women. 
Within high fashion imagery, such as this image by Barbier, Chinese interiors and Chinese pajama suits provided the model for a certain kind of modern woman and gave a frisson of transgression to modern lounging as a distinctively 20th century corporeal practice. Though any pair of Euro-American lounging pajamas that we find in a museum collection or on Etsy or on eBay could have been made in China, we cannot be sure. And as I've noted, the garment form itself seems perhaps South Asian, although it could also be a cousin of the South Chinese and Singaporean Samfu, which is a light trouser and jacket set. A second area of interest for me has been transcultural fakes. To take one example, the Chinese coat, which appeared from 1900 as a fashionable Western version of robes and long jackets that were worn in China in the late 19th century. These referenced, so the Chinese coats referenced the loose shaped um, wide sleeves and the embroidery patterns and the border decorations of 19th century Chinese garments. And sometimes turned opera coats and there are versions of these Chinese coats that appeared in Western fashion mainly in the first decade of the 20th century. And when I looked at um, particularly the example on the left, which is in the museum in Exeter, I thought immediately of the work of Mamie Radu and Akiko Savas, who've shown that there was um, a Japanese export kimono industry where Japanese merchants were producing kimono and other kinds of embroidered garments according to Western tastes. And this actually extended to the manufacture and making of Chinese, Japanese, or China, Japanese, Chinese coats. For example, these from the Japanese J department store Takashimaya, who also catered for export markets. The Japanese versions chime with a modernist aesthetic. They are often a simplified, more muted version of the Chinese coat with abbreviated visual references to the decorative borders of earlier Chinese women's fashions. Lastly, I've been working on altered and culturally recycled or repurposed garments across a wide field. One of my approaches has been to track a single garment type, the Chinese stroke Japanese shawl, and it's Chinese or Japanese, depending on, sorry, Chinese or Spanish shawl, and it's Chinese or Spanish, depending on where you stand. In other words, your position in time or in space or in culture. And this is the final focus of this paper. So Chinese shawls are in themselves a very fraught topic. As a garment type, they were developed initially out of the Spanish colonial trade via Manila and were an object made strictly for export in China by applying Chinese motifs to European garment forms in colors that appealed to European tastes. In Britain from the mid 19th century, they were sold as Chinese shawls. In Spain, they became entwined with Spanish national identity. This Spanish identity densely interwoven with colonial history in Latin America, together with Sino-British forms of colonial relations has tended to overshadow other cultures who also wore and or produced very similar embroidered shawls, such as Venetian women in Europe or Parsi communities in India. The shawls reached a high point of fashion in Britain in the 1920s, when they were simultaneously Spanish and Chinese, depending on the context. The Constant, ha Constant Howard Research Centre contains this jacket, which was brought to my attention because it appears to have been made from a Chinese shawl. Jackets of this type are seen in Western fashion mainly from the 1930s to 1950s. Like the pajamas within Western fashion systems, they were a new kind of Chinese garment type. They were also covered in Chinese style embroidery and like the pajamas, they are now widely found in fashion collections and secondhand markets, which points to their success and mass manufacture. These jackets sometimes place emphasis on modern life and sometimes on more traditional imagery. They also remind me of 20th century upper body garments for Chinese special occasion wear, such as this wedding outfit on the left from Shanghai around 19, in 1930, as well as the ways in which European garment features and body aesthetics were being incorporated into many East Asian and South Asian modernities and local fashion trends. There is much to support the family story told by the donor of this jacket, that in the 1930s, the jacket was made to order for a woman who wanted something new to wear on special occasions in Britain. We could speculate that she took an embroidered shawl that had become less fashionable and had it tailored into a jacket in exact imitation of the new Chinese jackets. The embroidery and silk crepe are exactly like shawl material. And there's something about the way in which the embroidery, although carefully positioned to make most, the most of the designs, is not actually embroidered to fit the shape of the jacket. Fringing, also in costume collections, provides proof positive that shawls were cut up as a source of embroidered fabric for the making of new garments. 
And I'll end with this jacket, which was worn within Western fashion contexts, but is thought to have come from the Philippines or Malaysia. The turned back lapels create a shape that reminds me of the Peronican Nyonya Kabaya blouse worn by women of Chinese heritage in Singapore and Malaysia. Comparisons of the buttons on the recycled shawl jacket, a non-recycled Chinese jacket, and the kabaya inflected jacket reveal a highly united approach. Tailors and embroiderers move around and teach their skills to others. Chinese tailors could be itinerant and also formed migrant communities in India and Southeast Asia. Chinese and sometimes specifically Shanghai tailors, important for ideas of fashion, are often cited as the source of locally produced Chinese embroidered garments in Penang, Malacca and Singapore, in Indonesia, in the Philippines, in India and in Japan at Yokohama. So in conclusion, I want to reflect on one of Peter Miller's opening remarks from yesterday, when he referred to the work of the hand and what constitutes culture. As embroidery builds stitch by stitch, whether by hand or by machine, and as garments are sewn, cut and re-sewn, we see culture through the language of materials and making techniques. Historians may perhaps better resist nationalist agendas that run counter to the material evidence of fashion by thinking about the de-centred and multiple fashion histories that spring up when using approaches that foreground fluidity and flux, recycling and the unfixed nature of fashions. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Now, um, let's see if we have questions right away. Yes, we might. Okay, not yet. It may be taking time for them to um, write them. So does the panel have any question for Sarah? Um, Sandy, I think there is a cute one Q and A about the fringing of shawl. Okay, so let's see. That's in. Am I not seeing that? Oh, okay. It's in the Q and A. Yeah. Hmm. Q and. Yes. Ah, can you? Ah, this one. I'm intrigued. Okay, this is Amelia. I'm intrigued by the fringing of the shores, especially with that great photo of the exercise fringe you showed, particularly the circumstances of mm. its manufacture. Is there much known about that particular sub activity of shore production? Um, the audience is thinking about how lace was an industry of specific interest in other national geographic contexts, particularly around the question of machine and hand manufacture. Thank you. Uh, well, first of all, I, I can't answer the question of machine and hand manufacture in relation to the fringing, but I have thought a lot about these fringes. Um, so they're silk fringes. They, they add a lot of weight to the garments. So although the, the garments are very thin crepe, the fringes are really heavy and they get very, very long by the 1920s. Um, so silk, silk tassels are, are, are seen commonly within a wide range of Chinese material culture and also part of some Chinese garments traditionally. So we know that there was already um, silk, fringe, silk uh, tassel making going on in China, which could have easily then become attached to the shawl production that was made originally for the Spanish market. Um, and then as you go into the 20th century, um, the shawls become, in, become very much part of dance cultures as well. And you want that movement. So they get longer and longer. And I think it's very tied to the idea of moving and this, these shawls, um, the fringing swinging around. And it also makes the, these shawls very um, awkward to wear. Um, and I've experimented with, with, with trying to, to wear an original um, shawl and they are very heavy and very difficult to wear. And you see a lot of images of women with these shawls kind of falling off them all the time and um, so they're very um I think they're very exciting and they're also really awkward for uh museum curators because they just get tangled up all the time so they have a they they're part of what I think is really important about the materiality the material agency of these objects because there's these fringes give these shawls a life of their own they won't behave um yeah. okay um, we have more questions. This one is, can you speak to the different contexts in which shores were represented as either Spanish or Chinese? Uh, yeah, um, this is a kind of a, a cheat answer because I've just published an essay about this. So it's very at the forefront of my mind. Um, but uh, yeah, um, so the, in um, Latin America 
and in um, Spain, they're unambiguously Spanish. In uh, Britain, it very much depends if you're with, if you're looking in a situation where it's very invested in British imperial history or not. So, for example, in uh, Liberty's department store, and in the V&A Museum and in the Great Exhibition of 1851, which are all very imperial spaces, it's all about China because Britain is, is exploring and engaging in uh, many kinds of colonial activities in relation to China and imperialist activities. Um, and although Spanish uh, textiles are shown, for example, in the Great Exhibition, they're, they're, um, the shawls are not seen um, there's, a, there's a real divide there. Um, but when you get to popular culture, dance cultures, and also kind of raunchy cultures within Britain, so the shawls being worn as a kind of glamour thing, then they're often also referred to as Spanish. And you get these amazing shawl parties, which are supposed to be Spanish parties, where the women are wearing a real mix of these, what I will term Chinese shawls, and they're also, they're wearing all manner of shawls. Um, so there's, I think there's a bit of a divide between popular cultures and imperial cultures, and there's also a, a bit of a cultural snobbery around them, I think. So the, the more socially elite you are, the more likely you are to say that it's a Chinese shawl. Uh, in, in America, it's a slightly different story, and perhaps I should um, curtail my answer for the moment, but I'm happy to talk about it more another time or, you know, uh, later. The next question is, can you explain a little more on the concept of material agency? Uh, well, um, I wouldn't say that I can um, tell everybody how to use this term, but for me, it's really about what do the material properties of the object mean for the users and how might the material properties and the ways in which we, we interact with the object or make the object or just some engagement with the object and its objectness, how does that affect the story and the history? How might that have changed how people felt about it, how they used it, um, how it was available or not available, these kinds of questions. Okay, we have time for one last question, which is the audience wondering if Chinese textile with Qing style motifs were still popular in England after the fall of the Qing dynasty. If yes, what contributed to their popularity? Is it exoticism? Is it refinement of the textile? Did English Myers consider Qing era garments as material witness to a decadent dynasty? Mm, I'd say yes to all of those questions and more. So um, they, I mean, part of it is about availability. So um, one, after the fall of the Qing dynasty, these garments are even more available than they had been in the past. Although there's always been a steady stream of garments coming into the West from China um, through secondhand markets. Um, I'm just trying to think about this question. It's a great question. Um, oh, it's vanished. Oh, that's because you've answered it. I'm sorry. But oh, I, well, think... I don't feel I've answered it at all. <laughs> um, I want to get back to that list of questions. Um, yeah, so I also think there's a lot of imperial nostalgia going on. So there's a, there's a, there's a nostalgia for old China. And um, when I say imperial nostalgia, I mean, um, Imperial from the sense of the British Empire, but also nostalgia for the for the Chinese Empire and for the, the fact that the, em the emperors have gone and, and so on. So anyway, thank you, Sarah. All right, so let's move on to our final presenter today, um, Hun Hifeng, who is Associate Professor of Art History at the Fashion Institute of Technology State University of New York. Her scholarship focuses on the history of collecting reception of Asian art, diaspora of Asian artists, and Asian American visual culture. She's a co-editor of a volume entitled Fashion Identity, Power in Modern Asia. As an independent curator, she has collaborated with contemporary artists in New York since 2013, and she's working on a project titled School Uniforms in East Asia, Fashioning Statehood and Self. I will now mute myself. Thank you, Sandy, uh, for wonderful introduction. And thank you so much for uh, organizing this wonderful symposium. I am learning so much. Okay, so reverse orientalism is an attitude of objectifying, romanticizing, and exoticizing their own culture by Asian citizens. 
they have learned how non-Asians, most likely imperial observers and consumers, perceive and glorify the cultural heritage of Asia and somehow apply those standards to their own sensitivity and aesthetics. Um, so these are the topic of my presentation, um, uh, George Nakashima and Isamu Noguchi. And I don't have much time to go over all of their uh, sartorial habits of it, but usually they are shown in this kind of um, workers' uh, uniform, not uniforms, <laughs> but like a, uh, workers' outfits. Uh, and um, uh, they usually are shown uh, in this manner. Recent publications such as The Orient Strikes Back or Orientalism and Reverse Orientalism in Literature and Film have discussed this view. Um, for example, Yanagi Soetsu, a Japanese uh, philosopher, uh, was often criticized for his romantic view of colonized cultures uh, of Korea and other places in his Mingye theory uh, that he popularized in the 1930s uh, with his book, Folk Crafts in Japan in 1937. This book was translated into English and distributed throughout 40s and 50s. In relation to development of modern pottery and furniture in the mid 20th century, Isamu Noguchi and George Nakashima represented the aesthetics of Asian design. Uh, like these kind of works. Um, so before uh, I address reverse orientalism in art and design of Nakashima and Noguchi, let's briefly consider cultural cross-dressing. Although cultural cross-dressing practices are considered unpleasant or condescending, not all of them are humiliating or pompous. Um, Samuel Sturgis Bigelow, for example, devoted himself to Buddhism in the 1870s, along with Ernest Fenelosa and Samuel Sylvester Morse. Another Bostonian, Charles Longfellow, visited Japan during their residency and collected a large amount of Japanese goods. As Christine Booth convincingly demonstrated in her book, Longfellow got an invisible memory of Japan with a tattoo on his back. Men like Bigelow and Longfellow were thoughtful and respectful visitors and collectors. Another direction of cultural cross-dressing was flourishing in Japanese photo studios. While Japanese were photographed in modern clothing, non-Asians non were in Japanese samurai clothing. People like Theophilus Alexander Singleton lived in Japan for 25 years as the principal of the firm Singleton Band and Company of London. A prominent anthropologist, Frederick Starr at the University of Chicago often dressed himself in a Japanese robe during his visit to Japan. On the other hand, Okakura Takujo, a Japanese uh, curator, art historian, adopted the Japanese clothing when he was working and living in Boston, although he was a fashionable dandy in European suit uh, in Japan. Or he designed a pseudo-Chinese robe for himself while he was visiting China and India. The cultural hybridity of Okakura can be interpreted as reverse Orientalism. In recent decades, a growing body of literature indebted to Edward Said's theory of Orientalism has begun to explore the phenomenon of self-Orientalism. This is also called auto-Orientalism, internalized Orientalism, reverse Orientalism, or Oriental Orientalism. Throughout the 19th and 20th century, it allowed various nationalist and anti-colonial thinkers to adopt a dichotomous view of East and West as they searched for their own uh, autonomous or authentic uh, essences or identities. Many such individuals found in Orientalism positive images of the Orient, whether in the guise of an imagined mystical East or fantastic fantasies of wealth and sensuality. 
One of them was Okakura Kakuzo, who argued the nationalist ideology of Japan in a pan-Asian history, such as ideas of the East, with a special reference to the art of Japan, written in 1903, and the awakening of Japan, 1904. Regarding cultural cross-dressing of Longfellow and Okakura, Christine Booth interpreted that they used the sartorial choices to overcome their social conditions. In Longfellow's case, the Meiji Japan, not yet modernized, was a comfortable place for Longfellow to be liberated from obligations in Boston. In Okakura's case, uh, he appropriated Chinese heritage by dressing himself in a Taoist robe he designed for himself made in Calcutta immediately after the Russo-Japanese War in 1904 and 5. What Okakura was aware of the West perception of Asia or Chinese culture was the appropriation as seen in the Japanese, both in fine art and popular culture in the late 19th century. In fact, the Japanese craftsmen uh, so I'm going over some of the slides. So uh, these are uh, famous paintings uh, of uh, cultural cross-dressing uh, or sometimes examples of cultural appropriation. So James Manuel Whistler um, at the uh, Free Art Secular Gallery uh, and James Tissot's La Japonaise with Cobain uh, and uh, Claude Monet's La Japonaise at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Uh, and uh, we have this kind of a Mikado poster um, as a popular um, Asian uh, entertainment. Uh, I mean, it's not really Asian per se, uh, it's a, a entertainment based on um, Asian uh, theme. Uh, and then even Vincent Van Gogh, who was imitating a lot of those uh, uh, ukiyo-e prints images. Uh, and uh, finally, my point, I cannot uh, spend so much time, but uh, as you see, the uh, Edouard Manet's uh, portraiture of Emile Zola, for example, um, you see this Kano style uh, pa uh, screen painting behind, and these are little uh, little souvenirs from um, Japan shop. And then, um, you know, Meiji period. Um, so this is where I was reading. Japanese imperial craftsmen created decorative arts that fit the expectation of Orientalists in the West. So there are a lot of these kind of Meiji metal work uh, in uh, Halili collection. So um, moving on. So uh, for Asians, living outside their home country, but trying to adopt Asian mode of living, I devise a term called a forceful exoticism. Earlier in 1920s, Japanese born American painter, Shiura Obata popularized the Kano style Nihonga painting in California. After 20 years, however, one could notice the modernist aesthetics of Japanese crafts Craft work uh, being popular in the context of mid century American arts and crafts movement. Um, in George Nakashima's woodwork furniture and in Isamu Noguchi's se semi figurative sculpture or design, I see the second generation Japanese American artists self adopted reverse Orientalism which became acceptable in high society living rooms in the middle of the 20th century. Buddhist scholar D.T. Suzuki, um, Suzuki's book on introduction to Zen Buddhism written in 1934 was translated into many languages and disseminated to other countries while Yanagi Soets disseminated his uh, theory of folk art. Art historian Bert Winter Kamaki talked about this period in his book, Art in the Encounter of Nations, Japanese and American Artists in the Early Post-War Years. Yuko Kikuchi's Japanese Modernism and Mingye Theory, Cultural Nationalism and Oriental Orientalism also discussed the Japanese colonialism and cultural authenticity for Western audiences. It is in this context of Asian aesthetics 
uh, customized for non-Asian audiences that artists like Nakashima or Noguchi, uh, who themselves came from transnational or interracial backgrounds, found a common ground to communicate with the viewers or customers of their work. Like the colonizers of the early 20th century, American citizens or viewers maintained a nostalgic view of Asia or Asian products, whereas the citizens in Japan, Korea, or Taiwan became cosmopolitan uh, global citizens in post-war Asia. I am planning to compare the section of Noguchi and Nakashima in Asian countries with those in American art journals in my full length paper. I argue that Asian artists and designers, whether having studied abroad or not, were marginalized in the discourse of contemporary design. This marginalization resulted from a long tradition of exoticism and orientalism of collectors of Asian art in the United States as well as a reverse orientalism by Asian artists themselves. A further discussion of aesthetics and identity of material culture from Asia needs to expand the scope uh, to include Asian immigrants, immigrant artists living in Europe or uh, in the United States um, in, in the early 20th century. So that's the end of my talk. Okay. Any question from the panel? Um, can I ask a question? To yes, of course. <laughs> Sorry not to try to hold the, the panel discussion, but uh, you deliberately used the, the word Asian throughout the paper, and then I'm, I'm kind of guessing there is an extra reason for it than actually much of the examples you we kind of seen through are actually Japanese, actually primarily, and then there aren't really any other kind of uh, the kind of you know, countries and, and specific cultures other than Japanese we've seen. So is there any reasons why you call it as a Asian rather than Japanese? Yeah, that is a, a problematic uh, word. I mean, these days, Asian American studies, we say Asians, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very wide term, right? It's, a, it's a never um, adopted by uh, you know, citizens of certain countries themselves. Uh, but um, in the mid century, uh, what is prevalently known as Asia are quite dominated by this, like a you know, Japanese American uh, design movement. So that's why I you know, kept using the word as Asia, but I am aware that it is a, a problematic uh, concept, uh, but uh, and also, you know, Japanese Americans um, in 1940s, uh, you know, the, the reception of Japanese Americans early 20th century versus uh, toward the you know, Second World War are very different. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, the kind of experience that uh, uh, George Nakashima and Isao Munoguchi went through uh, during the internment period is quite specific to Japanese. Uh, but uh, overall, um, you know, the, the the collector's taste, you know, usually late 19th and beginning of the 20th century, they really liked the kind of uh, decorative and, you know, luxurious, you know, like Asian objects. But then uh, mid-century, um, you start to see that those tastes change. Even collectors of a porcelain, Asian porcelain, they, Chinese porcelain or Japanese, they want to also collect some of the modern uh, style uh, porcelain and furniture as well. Um, so yeah, that, that's, uh, you know, that's my uh, intention. But uh, yeah, I am aware that uh, it is, you know, I have to be very careful not to use an umbrella term to describe the different like uh, um, ethnic or um, cultural groups uh, among Asians. If we say Indian Americans are also part of Asian Americans, it's also a very different story. Uh, but overall, like that Zen Buddhism, uh, like uh, this uh, shift in aesthetics uh, was very influential um, overall. Unmute myself. We have a question from an audience. Did Noguchi consider himself as an American artist or Japanese or between, or did he not care? 
which is a good question, I think. It is a very good question. Uh, there are more studies coming out on Isamu Noguchi. Um, so uh, he spent his uh, youth years in Japan. So he was clearly aware of his uh, Japanese heritage and um, his mother, American uh, writer, uh, very much tried to instill that uh, empowerment of his own uh, ethnic identity. but. Uh, we also know that when he came back to the United States for high school, he didn't want to use the last name of Noguchi. Uh, he briefly used um, sort of plain American name. Um, and then I think that he regained his identity and embraced it. Uh, and uh, that's why he, uh, you know, he adopted that principles of Japanese woodwork for uh, his own uh, artistic uh, practice. Um, so it is mixed, but it's uh, too much to us, but I, I think eventually he accepted it, but um, he's also uh, quite, uh, can I say, um, he was a political activist as well, right? So uh, yeah, being an American during the Cold War era was, uh, was also difficult for him. Uh, but very good question. Um, okay, so we have question actually from the panel. The first one is in fashion or costume terms, where do you draw the line between cultural cross-dressing and cultural appropriation? This is a very good question. Uh, everybody is still um, debating with this kind of boundaries, right? Like what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. Um, so if somebody can uh, explain their own reason and um, the kind of um, uh, authenticity of, of what I am, you know, doing this, you know, dressing in other people's, uh, other other cultures um, dresses. If you can fully explain, I think that is more like a respectable cultural cross-dressing as I referring in some of the examples. And uh, cultural appropriation, especially in the 21st century, um, it involves uh, either material profit or cultural capital. Like if you want to uh, sort of create a new brand of yourself or a new image of yourself or want to uh, market your products in, in this disguised, uh, you know, inauthentic other people's culture, then uh, it's obviously cultural appropriation. It's a very painful issue, especially when it, uh, uh, when it, 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 it is discussed with uh, designers. Sometimes innocently, they didn't know at all. Uh, but then, uh, you know, are you liberated from your responsibilities? Uh, because there is a certain, um, cultural capital of social recognition or, uh, or monetary reward, um, that's why it is also a very difficult um, matter. But like, you know, you know, you know like also we don't, you know, in this uh, image, uh, which in, you know, in, you know, image uh, where the uh, social media era, uh, you know, people should do their research before I make a decision. So we have one last question for your five minutes Q and A, and I think it's sort of a follow up question to the last question. Do you think that cultural cross dressing might also be political and connote solidarity? That is a very good question. Yes, I mean in a way, like a. Uh, um... You know, we see this in political campaigns, right? Like a, a use of colorful banners, or you know, like a color symbolism, or in a certain motif. Um, so, uh, yeah, again, if you can explain your intention, your authenticity uh, very well, uh, then I think it is, uh, it is, it, you know, it, it can be uh, a, a political uh, campaign. Uh, and um, yeah, it can, uh, you know, connote a certain uh, solidarity. Uh, 
in a way, you know, think about that uh, Zhong Shan suit, Zhong Shan suit. Uh, that was originally a military uniform coming from even like a Prussia or, you know, you see the 19th century army, European armies, but uh, when it was embraced for uh, self-strengthening and, you know, nationalism, uh, it became, you know, quite well implemented. Um, so these days, uh, Zhong Shan suit, we don't really think of as a, cultural appropriation of Europe. I mean, it, it's really well implemented. Um, so um, yeah, there will be an example of uh, cultural cross-dressing um, that connotes uh, solidarity. Okay, so that's the end of the five minutes for our final speaker. Thank you very much. And can I now ask all the speaker on both day to come on screen so we can have a concluding discussion. And actually um, we might start um, not just with the audience, of course, feel free to ask us question in the Q&A box, but I think Hugin has a question. Do you want to ask out loud? I will read that out. Is there a difference between the reverse Orientalism of overseas born Asians and Asian born Asians? Yeah, the di difference. This is quite subtle. And also, um, as Yuna pointed out, it would be quite different uh, from like a certain ethnic or cultural community individually. Um, so I cannot, you know, speak for a broad, uh, you know, Asian communities overall. But uh, if if what what I feel a lot about these, you know, difference between the reverse Orientalism of overseas-born Asians and Asian-born Asians are in contemporary art. So uh, our, you know, artists who, who got their uh, BFA and MFA and in, in, in one Asian country and then came over to the United States versus, uh, let's say, Asian American uh, artists mm -hmm. who grew up here and you know, educated and working as an artist here, uh, quite different uh, in terms of their, their perception of their own, own cultural heritage. Uh, and uh, but when but both groups of artists when they work with powerful sort of influential collectors, let's say in Chelsea uh, gallery system in New York City or you know like a London gallery systems, uh, those successful ones are very keen on what the West perceives of Asia, um, and. Um, I work with a lot of contemporary artists of my own generation, and we candidly talk a lot about this because um, you know you you want to be recognized, right? And um, you know those group of, in my own mind, uh, influential collectors, what they want versus what uh, public art institutions wanted for their acquisitions are slightly different. Um, so um, you know, like uh, one's works can be quite popular among. Uh, public art institutions, but uh, are they really well collected by collectors? Not necessarily. Um, so um, yeah, it is very important um, question, uh, but yeah, there is a subtle difference. It could be personal, but it could be, um, I would say, upbringing, uh, but, uh, but also you know, the, the environment that they are living in can be quite influential for creating those kind of uh, differences. Thank you. Um, Any question amongst ourselves? Otherwise, I have one for Anna. Um, Anna, I'm just curious um, about the example you gave because it immediately reminds me of Cabinet of Curiosity. So I'm wondering, um, do you know um, about you know, the original ownership and then the dissemination, um, et cetera? Yeah. And I'm not actually talking about any particular, um, but just in general. Yeah, 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 I get it. Yeah, Cabinet of Curiosity, of course, absolutely. Um, and the different um, brand, like forms of that in different parts of Europe. Um, Portuguese ships in the beginning, but then like the example that I started, um, the Viteleo, the white lion, right? With the shells on board. So then the Dutch took over. Um, of course, obviously, 
the big thing in the trade was not the shells. They were the byproducts. They don't even appear on the inventories. That's why the maritime archaeology is so important in that regard. Um, yeah, and from the Dutch ships or in the beginning, the Portuguese ships, um, gift giving networks all over Europe. Um, then they end up in the goldsmith's workshop, um, commissioned by the collector or not commissioned by the collector. And that's where the frame is applied and that's where the shell is transformed. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Any question among ourselves? I don't see any yet. Um, okay. I have one. Um, okay, Anna, and then um, Miga just type one. So Anna first. Oh, sorry. No, no, no. no. Yeah, Miga, you go first. Oh, Anna. Okay. <laughs> totally happy for you to go first. You go first. Yeah, um, okay, I want to. I would want us to talk about terms like design craftsmanship um, and anything that's related to that. I mean, that's just the English terms that we use um, because we cannot use the, the Indian, Chinese or Japanese terms in the English translation. But in how far do you struggle with these terms? Because I struggle with them, of course, um, obviously very much because I'm talking on the early modern period where the term design and craftsmanship don't really have much use basically, but I still need to use them. Um, but yeah, so I would be interested in that kind of broader discussion and how you deal with these questions. Um, Sandy, how do you want to do it? Are we, uh, do we just raise our hands or is there a hand raised? We just actually oh. raise our hand this way. If you want to, for instance, answer Anna's question. Yes, Minga. Um, and then and then Yuna. And then Sarah. <laughs> um, yes. So and the then first, Sarah. I think it's a really important question, actually. And this is something Yuna and I talk about a lot. Um, I, from my perspective, the terms design and craft um, as English terms in India are, you know, are laden with coloniality and uh, particularly with colonial modernity. So how I deal with that, any, anything that's made in a particular political and cultural context within India in a particular given moment is what is the term that is being used by the people who are using them and what language they are using them in. So in India, often the word kala becomes the word which in a broad sense means art. Um, so I think, I think the use of the term in itself, I think is signals how it's used, why it's used. So that's where I go. I go straight to the source. Okay, then Yuna. Uh, yes, I mean that is uh, that is actually a really good question. And and then in terms of kind of translating, because the word represents our kind of process of thought, doesn't it? So so we, I mean, there is a there is a, some discussion we actually written in the design journal of design history when I edited the uh, volume with Yuko Kikuchi and the, some of the uh, the introductory about Japanese and, and Chinese and Korean kind of translation of actually you know used the kind of terms actually how that's been interpreted and maybe the equivalent and or slightly different kind of terms been used represent quite similar but not exactly the same thing so. So in terms of Korean terms, I think design is very much actually considered to be something post Second World War. And then even now until, until about 1960s actually properly incorporated into kind of Korean society when they start really thinking about kind of a kind of an industrial kind of mass produced design and then within the industry. And so that's when the design comes in. And when we think about the craft, is a craft is actually you know kind of East Asian context is it kind of go through really lots of different kind of uh, uh, the translate in terms of the transformation of the meanings from particularly from about 18th century onwards and it reached to quite, quite a kind of reaching to certain terms very articulated well in Japan and because they gone through this kind of process of actually kind of uh, uh, adopting the the kind of European term and then actually making up the Japanese term using Chinese kanji. So they actually have this very developed process and that has been written around actually quite several times in different publications. So yes, yeah, so that is a, something actually really very interesting actually to think about those terminologies, yeah. And Sarah? Um, 
in my work in yeah. fashion history, we 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 have the um, big issue of the word fashion itself, uh, which is a in terms of a debate is very closely tied to how we might want to use the word design. And for me, again, it comes down to what words were used at the time or in the place. And specifically with fashion, I'm thinking about, do these words relate to concepts of time? Do they relate to concepts of selfhood? Because my definition of fashion is going to be about style change. And I want to know what that meant for people in terms of marking time or thinking about the self. Um, but so often, as we've been saying, it's overlaid with um, coloniality as a, con as a condition and quite often as a condition of modernity. Um, and style change is also so intimately bound up with the whole experience of being modern and modernity as well. So I think also I was thinking about this in relation to the conversations we were having earlier about Orientalism and self-Orientalism, reverse Orientalism, that you can't ever really step outside of the coloniality of the situation. So it's, you know, you can identify it, you can think about strategies to work with it or against it or within it or to one side of it, but you can't ever just remove it from the situation. And Huey? Um, yes, yeah, so I, I just want to pick up on Yuna's point, really, which is about you know, Japan being able to actually compartmentalize like idea of design. And absolutely right, you know, um, the word design is often written, it's in written katakana, it's you know, the alphabet for foreign, you know, derived words. So it's very much categorized within this kind of Western foreign canon. So it belongs over there. Uh, and it's often used for cool kind of words as well, you know, and it's also used to like, sort of say it's modern and not Japanese and all of that. So it's very much part of that in that sense. However, I was also thinking about how, you know, in my te teaching practice in product design, the students themselves that I teach, the designers that I, you know, work with my colleagues, they see themselves, that th there's a lot of discussion about process and what is design and craft, especially among the furniture makers. Um, and, you know, it's important to firstly to remember what the practitioners themselves intend, you know, the intentionality of the practitioners um, as they make their product or whatever it is and relation to mass production. And also the nature of craft is now moving on the ground. So it's not just something that's done by hand or fashioned by hand and transformed, but also actually looking at things like 3D printing. You know, um, some people are arguing that these are craft pieces in themselves where you get real life um, 3D printing happening in art pieces, for example. So automation doesn't necessarily always mean design, it can actually be linked to craft. And likewise, design pieces can be made painstaking by hand and still be called design pieces. So it, it's a quite a fluctuating area. And I do really agree as well with, um, you know, um, Mego and, and, and Sarah's ideas that, that, that these things are dependent on time as well. So. You know, it depends on, on how they interpreted it in that moment uh, and how we interpret what design and craft is right now is perhaps different from 50 years ago and is different from, you know, even before then. Anybody raise yes, Yuna? Stacy goes first. She raised her hand first, then me. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, well, actually, I was just going to um, add it to you, Sandy, because it seemed to me that there are strong echoes here of, um, you know, the early modern period in China and the the painters who, who went overseas to Japan um, to learn a Western style of painting and then bringing that back as a form of modernity within China. Right. Yes, so you're right. Um, so I think to answer in a short way, um, this is what I think about craftsmanship because I've been thinking about that a lot lately. Um, the way in the Chinese tradition, how it is defined, it's the combination between arts and craft and particularly on something that's um, handmade. So um, 
Stacey's point about sending um, sort of modern artists in the early 20th century to Japan to actually learn an, almost like a new kinds of craft so that they can revitalize their own. I, I think that's quite interesting in itself. And that's something I might look into um, later. But the craftsmanship, like I'm thinking about in the context of my work, it's it's kind it's still problematic because I teach design students and when I whenever I mention the term craftsmanship, they always think it must be something that's handmade and it must be something that's old. They don't think that because for me, um, craftsmanship nowadays it refers to anything that's well made and that it then has really good functions. But they don't seem to understand it that way. They they think craftsmanship belongs to the past. And whatever that's made now, especially in design, they think it's made with technology rather than craftsmanship. But I think a good, well-run machine, it's good craftsmanship. So that's that's something actually I, I struggle with. I also struggle with the word design also because a lot of the um, objects that are, I, I look at, they are still defined as decorative arts. They're not fine arts, they're not design, they're sort of something in between. And it makes them sound very frivolous. You know, like, like the, some of the example in my PowerPoint today, they would be considered decorative arts. So yeah, so these terms, I actually um, struggle with that. Stacey, did I actually answer your question in some way? Okay. I put a follow up in, in, in the text to you because I also wonder in relation to, to what we call design students today, if they're thinking in terms of the Chinese word for. But can I say something? I think I went mute. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, oh, you got, yeah, there is a text. So um, I was originally a, a medievalist. So uh, when we say design, you know, like a, that, you know, the design, like a device, right? But you, it comes out of your intention and, you know, with your subjectivity, that is the beginning of the Renaissance, right? And then um, everything made before the Renaissance, um, they were sort of a craft's work. Uh, that's how European medieval art was considered by, art historians or theorists of art uh, in, in early modern and later modern period. Um, so uh, when we in, in, the, in the current um, uh, like a pedagogical environment, uh, I personally try to be very careful when I teach non-Western uh, art surveys um, so that I don't want to give an impression that anything made in non-Europe or outside Europe or Euro, Euro America <laughs> um, are like a handmade uh, sort of a you know reluctant to automate you know those kinds. I mean if you think about the Ming Dynasty porcelain production, it is an extremely efficient system, isn't it? Um, it's almost like a, if you think about the uh, a production management side, it is well uh, managed the system. Um, it, it's not old fashioned, it's not uh, like a homespun. It was a major production organized by the government. Um, so uh, yeah, it, it comes out of our own uh, pedagogical principles, you know, how to present um, certain uh, artworks or, you know, like a, a creative um, products uh, from uh, regions other than um, Euro, Euro America, <laughs> like areas. Um, yeah, so that, that's my view uh, these days. So, uh, um, you know, I use uh, crafts and design sometimes interchangeably uh, because I don't want to give an impression that uh, any uh, art, you know, like uh, handmade products are just a uh, sign of. Uh, uh, Free modernity or uh, indigeneity or something. Okay, so um, shall we move on to Miga's question, which I thought it's a good one. Miga, do you want to talk about? No. Uh, you want to talk about how we study materials to develop transnational histories? Right? Yeah, I want to. I want. 
I have been thinking while I was writing my paper for this, I was thinking of terracotta as a as a color, also as a pigment and as a as a symbol of the earth and, and Indian heritage. So I was so how are we because there are several people here who are dealing with materials, really thinking about materials and how what other methodologies or methods you might be using to study materials, particularly when you're thinking about history. And, you know, where do you go? How do you do it? Um, so, you know, how each of us does it was my question. So, who, yes, Yuna? Did somebody raise their hand? Is it Sarah? Sarah. Sarah raised her hand. I'm trying to be very law abiding here. <laughs> not speak until I'm called upon. Um, I'm I'm always really interested in where um, discourses of indigeneity come up in relation to this. So what I'm, I think, you know, there are particular kinds of earth or minerals or plants or animals that actually occur in lots of different places on the globe. Um, and there are also lots of techniques, so weaving techniques or motifs that many different cultures can have in common and seem to have arisen very separately. And then there's lots of intercultural mixing on top of that and global flows of all kinds of things. So what I'm always interested in, in relation to this is, where is there a strong discourse of indigeneity? Does it hold true? What is about transplantation? And then what is about naturalization as well? So have things been successfully transplanted and naturalized? And at what point are we going to then say they're indigenous to that place as well? So when I'm using the term indigeneity here, I'm not referring to the idea of indigenous peoples. I'm actually talking about where do materials um, come from in terms of uh, either an originating culture or an originating place or an originating geography or landscape. So that for me is one way in which I, I would think about this kind of thing. Um, and it gives me something against which to then measure the concept of the transnational. Does that make any sense as a, a first attempt to answer it, your question, Megha? It really, really makes a lot of sense because I think we are not studying materials as in their necessarily their chemical component, but their cultural components and their historical frameworks and the geographies of materials because um, yeah, and I find that really fascinating how 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 we engage with with that history. So no, your answer was really great. Yeah, thank you. Okay, did someone else raise their hand? Stacy? Yeah, Stacy. Yes, it was me. Um, well, I. Stacy, you're on someone. Mute. I could speak as. Should I, am I unmuted now? No, yeah. not anymore. Okay, so if I could speak as someone who actually does deal with materials in, ter in terms of composition, I mean, that's the primary frame through which I look at ceramics. However, um, within material science, there is a strong tradition of looking at transfer, um, of the, the physical transfer of actual material, as well as the transfer of techniques of materials management. And transfer, I find, tends to be a, um, a fairly neutral term for this that tends to avoid, um, probably shouldn't, but tends to avoid issues of indigeneity, if that's a word. Um, however, it's closely connected to um, trade, you know, and I'm sure Anna would confirm this. And so that's when through trade, I think that materials then become culturalized and cultural representations, if that makes sense. Yes, it does make sense. Thank you. That's really, really, that's a different angle. I'm, I'm really fascinated. By that. Okay, I see three hands. I see Anna, Yuna, and Hugh Yates. So I think Anna goes first. I think the term agency was already brought up by one of the questions. It was a question to Sarah, I think. Um, so like when we see transfer as related to trade and commodification and notions of like passivity and where like the object is not at the center, but the human agency is kind of objectifying and commodifying and so on and so forth, then I think the material agency, all ideas related to that would be at the opposite end of that spectrum, probably. 
Um, and I don't want to say too much about it because it's such a complex concept, but I find the idea of vibrant matter very helpful. And I do work with the term agency, although not everybody will like that. That's fine. Um, because, yeah, like vibrant matter in terms of the political scientist Jane Bennett, but also in relationship to Gaston Bachelard and all of this, um, I don't think it's like the one thing that solves all our problems. But I do think it's very interesting, especially in relation to the transcultural histories that we're trying to tell, because we look at matter as something that has a voice by itself and that expresses something that was not documented in the written records. We have the written records of all the elites. Like, I mean, I talk about elite collectors myself, but like what are the voices of the craftsmen really, of the people um, who use these things as daily objects. And that's why we listen to the voice of uh, objects. And in that sense, they have agency and in other ways they have agency too, as far as I'm concerned. Um, yeah. Um, Yuna? I was actually, can you hear me? So I was thinking more about actually towards the, the second part of the Mega's question about transnational actually, because uh, you know, transcultural and transnational is a slightly different thing. Because uh, you know, even though we can, in one way it's actually kind of, it, it's, you know, it, we kind of thinking, talking about similar thing, but actually transnational actually to connotate the, the, the boundaries of nation and then, you know, transnational only, Kind of uh, comes to the discussion because of the kind of dis discussions of a nation in a way. So one of the things I was thinking about is how the kind of a, the state and the kind of national psyche actually pick up certain materials as as a kind of a you know kind of a as as a kind of discourse of actually kind of a identifying national identities and and the national kind of a psyche of their kind of country. So that process, you know, thinking about the materials and how that is actually enables people to think about their nationhood in a, in a, in a kind of coherent way. And then that might be, then how, then how does it change actually, or how does, you know, how does it impact when you actually come into the, you know, kind of a, across the nation or actually two nations meet, it's, it's actually in the middle and kind the of people who actually kind of meet in the middle actually. So. So I think in one way, you know, thinking about materials as a kind of methods which can then mobilize by that kind of a nationalist discourse and might be one way of actually thinking about, you know, in that process, then what goes beyond the national kind of boundaries and how that transforms. So it kind of carries a bit of more kind of political connotation possibly. And that's one way of it. I was thinking about it. So particularly I was thinking about when we're talking about, you know, postlin actually, you know, postlin we actually kind of, uh, as a kind of China, so because it has been cultivated as a kind of Chinese material for you know with the long histories and all that, and you know certain kind of uh, materials actually have a very strong resonance with that particular country. So, like uh, Sarah said about actually kind of embroidery, <laughs> embroidered uh, the scarf was actually kind of having that very strong ch uh, Chinese or Spanish. So I think it, it's kind of those kind of boundaries of nation is something we can also kind of wrestle with when we're thinking about the material. Huey? Uh, um, yeah, so I was sort of thinking about how, you know, that um, how materials are used, I suppose, by, again, the designers, the original kind of people wanting to make these objects. And ideal. Um, I'm always really attracted by the ephemeral, low value item, which, you know, has no significant collectible meaning at the time. And, but nevertheless, because they're so widely distributed and mass produced, they kind of are significant for a general, you know, psyche, as, as you know, a saying of the nation. Um, and, I'm, and again, you know, also to, to uh, reciprocate what, you know, Anna's also saying about, you know, the, how do we we capture this. And I also think about, you know, that my design students who I teach and the designers who aren't actually interested in ideas of nationhood, very rarely, you know, are they thinking about that. They're mostly thinking about commerce. They're thinking about selling their design, making it attractive for the tastes of general public who they, you know, kind of try and get a snapshot of. And, some, and often they're quite interested in pushing the material boundaries. You know, can I gold plate this? Can I put pewter on bark there? And they're not, they're not really thinking about the cultural connotations and yet they create the cultural material from which we then derive this idea of culture, you know, the stuff, the thingness. So it's a really complicated thing to analyze because we overlay lots of meaning on top of it. And yet underneath it, um, 
you know, practicing designers, of which I used to be one, so I do know that understanding, they aren't thinking about that whatsoever. And it's just sort of what happens organically. It's almost like organic matter. So the, the organic materiality of material, I suppose, and how it's used and applied has also got to be acknowledged with no kind of strategy in place. It just sort of seems to then permeate through society to become this cultural phenomenon that happens, which I do think is wonderful. It's just, there's this vibrancy and joyousness, but also randomness and evolution, uh, a natural kind of evolution that happens to it. So I think it's important to acknowledge that maybe even you know, if we're developing study materials, um, to acknowledge that to anyone you know, uh, accessing it, um, you know, to, to say it wasn't part of a strategized plan. It's, it's just people doing random things. And then we get culture, which I think is quite wonderful. So Sandy, I want to say like a one uh, final remark you know, based on this question. Okay, so um, could, oh, Sarah. No, so you go first, and then Sarah. Okay. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I um I agree with what Huyin said very much. Um. So uh, in in actual classrooms, when we discuss uh, the transnational histories of a certain material or certain an artwork, um, you know, we always uh, end up uh, having this uh, like a legal boundaries of mercantile capitalism, which was established in the 15th or 16th century, like a, a copyright laws, a property issues, or tariffs. All these are like a boundaries of um, art makers. They have to work around uh, in the 17th and 18th. And, and now we see those uh, impact of those uh, copyright issues, even our own contemporary period. Right, like you, you can use only certain motifs, um, and um, even for our own practices, we have to ask permissions to use any images for our own uh, scholarly papers and so forth. But then you still have those uh, communities uh, which refuse to record a nation. Think about nomads. We still have nomads in Anatolia or somewhere, you know, northern part of India, and you know, like these areas, um, and um, there is actually no uh, national boundaries, but uh, they are the communities usually produce uh, highly uh, profitable materials like a pashmina, right? Cashmere, you know, those natural products. And um, back in the 19th century, those animal products were coming from Amazon forests or uh, South Asian, um, you know, maritime areas and so forth. Um, so it is really important issue, but the more we try to teach these concepts, uh, like interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary uh, approaches are, are inevitable. Um, Sarah? Yeah, I just wanted to respond to what Hui Ying was saying that um, I absolutely agree that in the, the moment of design and creativity, it, there is just this organic, happening and it takes no notice of whose culture should I be using or should I you know, it's just about pushing and thinking and creating but then it seems to me that what happens is that if you are any if you are a commercial designer then you need backers you need you might need government um, support of some kind you may need to get support from local commercial systems uh, and certainly you will you need to be represented in the media whatever media you're in and then narratives need to be written around what you do and this is where everything just suddenly gets tied down to nation again or to particular ideas about culture isn't it where you've got the object and then you've got to sort of sell it or you've got to get somebody to invest in it as a sort as a cultural strategy and I think that's really where the problem lies for me. Miga? Yeah I want to I think you all have brought such interesting rich um, you know perspectives on this question and I think what you are saying is really important um, in terms of looking at the contemporary to understand the past. And I think it does tell us, can help us study the past. But when in the past, those people are dead, but you see a trend, I think there are certain conclusions we can draw um, from the particular moment in which they live and how they, and how they use those. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, that perspective on how the students produce something comes from um, a particular cultural moment. And, you know, the idea that you, whatever you do, 
is what you see is culturally constructed rather than natural, I think is a very important framework, I would say, for understanding how designers use it. Um, anybody else has any follow up on that? Um, in fact, um, I was just uh, chatting with Stacy in the chat box privately because it seems I sort of misunderstood her question because I was getting a lot of echoing just now. It's better now I have my earbuds on. Um, she was actually asking me about um, how when Chinese artists who went to Japan to train in painting in the art school where um, Western painting was the dominant style that they then brought back to China as modernism. And that seems, and I agree um, entirely, that it echoes the transcultural, colonial, orientalizing themes that's being discussed now. So actually, this is the kind of thing that I'm thinking about that was um, also discussed earlier, about the difference between cultural appreciation and cultural appropriation. It, are they the same thing or, or are they different? And, you know, in, in my study of modern art when I was doing my PhD thesis, um, going to Japan to study for um, Chinese artists, um, it, some people would consider that being colonized in a way, twice, you know, by, by the Western style um, painting or design and then filter through um, Japan. So this whole idea of sort of uh, transcultural or transnational um, history, I think it's really interesting. And I think this is something we should explore more. Anybody wants to follow up on that? Um, I'm not sure if you can see my hand up. Yes. Sandy. Okay. Yes. <laughs> um, yes, absolutely to follow up. Oh, actually, I was going to follow up on Mega's um, comment and then yours, if that's okay, because they're both so good. So firstly, very quickly, Mega, I would say it's also really important, of, of course, and as I was saying before, and as Sarah is saying as well, it's important to see um, uh, design histories of materials in that moment and, and what they have, the intentionality behind their production, etc. But it's also important to have a post reading of it as well. After all, that's what, you know, studies of post colonialism has been about. We look back to the past and say we need to remove the statue because our reading of it is completely different now. So that's really, really important as well to remember that our sort of um, understandings of history move on so that the voices, of, uh, more voices can be heard, not just of certain dominant canonical ones. So um, Sandy, on your point, um, which, hang on a minute, let me just, uh, yes, I want to further complicate that reading because, <laughs> because um, oh, I, I, for some reason, the author's name has completely escaped me, but in her wonderful book about Japanese culinary history, um, she, oh, and I have her book on my shelf, so, you know, um, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to get into that now, but just to say that she does a wonder. Uh, she does. She posits that in the Meiji Restoration period, Japan deliberately westernized itself in order not to be colonized because it had to align itself and be seen as Western, and therefore not seen as Asian, and therefore not to become a colonized uh, a, a target of colonization by Western powers. So, in fact, that's neither appropriation in that sense, I think, or appreciation. I think it's political necessity. And um, I think, you know, that's quite an interesting reading of that side. Okay, that's very interesting. Make sure you send me the name of that book. Um, Miga, we have three minutes left. So um, Miga responds. Um, I, it depends on where, it's, where this is happening um, and where you're looking at it from. Um, you know, um, uh, an Indian uh, man wearing trousers over a dhoti, for example, or a lungi means that they are, you know, they are already placed as um, someone who is not modern yet, and therefore they must be modern, uh, and and there the political necessity becomes really important. But I think again the fine line uh, between appreciation and appropriation is can also be political. Um, and I was thinking of that when I asked the question about uh, solidarity, um, and and sometimes depending on the situation. Um, if someone is giving up something and adopting something or adapting something, they might be rejecting something else as well. So I think it's a very complex scenario rather than a, a binary or um, yeah, all, all those two necessarily. Okay, Sarah, do you want to respond quickly? 
Yeah, and Meg, I just ended up where I was about to begin, which is I don't think it's an it's an or question, it's an and question. I, I think the I think I don't think it's a debate to be had, is it appropriation or appreciation? I think the terms of that debate are not helpful. It, it, it's about it's appropriation and it's appreciation. Um, and I, I, it's really interesting to think about the example of the, the of, of uh, Meiji Japan that Hui Ying refers to because um, it clearly there there there's a particular intent there uh, around um, power and who has it, and what you can't escape is the coloniality of the scenario. Uh, so no matter where you stand on it, you are in that situation of of uh, colonial modernity. Um, sorry, if I can jump in, absolutely, Sarah. Like uh, the whole reason the Meiji Restoration happened was because gun American guns were turned on uh, Japan and forcing it to open up. So absolutely, um, you know, it was in response to the threat of colonization, colonization that Japan adopted Western uniforms, started having furniture to eat instead of sitting on the floor, adopting Western cutlery and starting to eat meat more. So there were all of these things sort of happening in response. And in a way, you could say that they were also there for the products of colonization, just a cultural colonization in which they readily took up the culture in order not to be politically colonized, if that makes sense, or actually colonized. So it is really complicated. <laughs> Okay, I'm afraid we're out of time. It's exactly 1130 and we could be here for hours. And I was just thinking it would have been so nice if we were meeting in person, we can talk about this over our conference dinner. So um, I guess that will happen at some point in the future, perhaps as a follow up to this um, symposium when everyone is um, available to travel. So with that, um, I'd like to conclude by thanking all of you for participating, all your hard work, especially with the health crisis, it's been especially hard to do research. So I really, really, really appreciate everything you've put into your paper and making the symposium really productive, really successful, and really interesting exchange amongst um, all of us. I also want to thank um, Bart Graduate Center for um, sponsoring us and for Laura's um, her you know, managing all the logistic. And I will um, email all of you to follow up on um, the symposium on various issues, okay? So thank you very much and have a great day. And hopefully we'll see each other in the very near future. Bye.